Tell me, hi. Bye. How much is the net? Are you okay? Okay, next time, bye. Have I ever not delivered my word? Our auntie say bye, Karen, bye, bye. Okay. Now, uh, my house got. I bring it. Actually, I want to install Netflix, son. Yeah. At our that that corner there, actually, I want to put Netflix. That's why if if I put, I will make sure that. But I was thinking, I don't want to. And you all every day watch movie at that. That our graph drop. Oh. Performance graph drop. Okay. Uh, last week we sorry, not even last week. Two days back. So we talk about the governance uh, structure. What does the code tells us? The things that listed company has to do. Now we only started off at the beginning, right? So they only tells us about how the company must have an effective board. So it goes on with the issue about entrepreneurial leadership. Now, then we talk about the separation of chairman and CEO. And I, I stress on why an effective CEO is very critical in terms of governance standard. Now, and we stop there because the next part of the code actually goes into the board structure. So, I brought you to this page to look at uh, how does a multi-tier board structure works. So the main distinction which I show you, which is something very different that we have not come across, is the power of appointment. Because normally, directors are appointed by shareholder. But I, I've showed you an example where directors may not be appointed by shareholder. So I use the example of German, how that in their law, they would have half of the directors appointed by shareholder half of the directors are representative of employee. But these are the directors at the supervisory level. That means they don't actually involve in running of the business. But they are the ones that oversee the management board, those who run the business. Now, but still, uh, uh, I would like to come back and focus at Unitree board. Now, we come from an environment, all right? We come from an environment where Unitree board is our main practice because we follow a lot in UK, okay? Now, what's a Unitree board again? It's a board that the ED and the NED will sit together, okay? It's a board that ED and ED will sit together in the same board. Now, basically, we are just saying you only have one board. Lah. There's just one board, that's it, okay? That's called Unitree board. So, uh, we try to look into... Uh, what's so good about Unitree Board to understand the strength, the advantages? So I'll highlight a couple of points to you. Okay, now so if you just come to page seventy-four, all right, page seventy-four. Now I'm going to stress on a few terms that I just want you to know about uh, why Unitree Board can be more superior. Now really, that there's no such thing as my board structure is better than the other. Because usually at the end of the day, it's about your circumstances. It might suit your culture, but it doesn't mean it suit my culture. You know? So it's like it, it all depends, all right? It all depends. Okay, but the first thing that it says here is, when you're in a unitary board, right, the members all have equal legal responsibility. Now, what is the meaning of this thing called equal legal responsibility? Now, I, I would suggest probably we will add another word here. For the word responsibility, I will probably substitute with this word called legal accountability. <clears throat> okay? Equal legal accountability. Now what I'm trying to say here is when you sit inside a unitary board, right, your status as a director is the same. Okay, because 
but by looking at ED and NED, you probably will have the perception like the ED has more work to do, the NED has less work to do. So the, the ED seems to be more powerful, the ED has less power and stuff like that. You, you might have that kind of concept and think that one kind of director is more superior than the other kind of director. Now, but unfortunately, or, or probably fortunately, that in the eyes of the law, actually it's not like that. In the eyes of the law, right, Uni3 board, all directors are the same. They are all director. So when they all carry the same status, they carry the same accountability, they also share the same liability. That's why when you go to, example, when you, when you come to a board meeting, when you ask directors to, to vote before a resolution, they didn't say that, oh, you're ED, right? Uh, your vote got less power or your vote got more power. They don't say that. So if the board has nine directors, we need five directors to say yes. Then it will go ahead. We'll pass the resolution. And, and that five directors can all be the NED. It really makes no difference. So that's, why, that's what we're trying to say. They are all equal. Okay? They are all same before the law. So if directors are all same before the law, what effect do we get? Okay, what effect do we get? To, to think of this point, then we must ask ourselves, if you really become a director in a unitary board, do you think your risk of being a director is higher if you're ED or NED? Or probably I rephrase the question. Uh, what kind of risk that you will have as an NED? Okay, usually director, the, the main risk is the risk of not discharging their duty. That means you're not doing your job, understand not? So you, you've been negligent, all right? Negligent in the sense like you never discharge your duty of care. You breach trust. That kind of thing can be your problem. So in what way that as, as an NED, that kind of risk is associated with you? Don't understand my question. Okay, make it easier, all right? ED and NED, who gets more information? Obviously, right? Because they're always in the business. NED is always not in the business, correct? Not? So they, they don't they don't they are not present all the time. So it's actually quite natural for NED to be uh, so-called uh, conceal a lot of information, or probably they're just not aware. Lah, okay, they're just not aware because they're not always there. Can you see not? Now because of this ignorance the lack of information, they, they, they may likely fall into the problem like, for example, they make decisions uninformed. Things they do was decided without properly looking at all the available information. For example, they probably are being uh, fooled by the ED. The ED don't tell everything to them. You, you don't get the full picture, you see. You get half of the story. They tell, oh, that's good, okay, they made a decision. So you have decided something which is actually not proper. Now, and can I use the excuse that how do I know? Then you protect yourself from whatever allegation or whatever wrongdoing just by saying, how would I know? Just like you're, you're arrested for speeding. Then the police say that, do you know you're driving at 120 and our speed limit is 110? You tell the police, how do I know? I never study or I, I don't know. I never see the sign for 110. How do I know? Is there a valid reason? It's never a valid reason, right? So that, that put NED in a position that you're more risky naturally. That's why people always say that if you are invited to be a non-executive director, you better think three, four times why you're asked to take up the job. And especially if this, this is an invitation from somebody you totally don't know. Out of blue, somebody just call you and say, hey, we want an independent director. Do you want to see in our board? Huh? I mean, you've you got to really wonder, like, why you? I mean, what's so great about you? I mean, unless you find that you have a value to contribute, then it's a different story. If not, you might just be made as a scapegoat. You know? So that if anything happens, uh, you die first. Uh, they send you to jail because they say, I'll charge the director. Now, so if, if that is what we are saying, then logically, as an NED, right, how do you protect yourself? So I just want to sum up what I say. You bear greater liability, okay? NEDs bear greater liability 
as a result of the lack of information, you bear greater liability. Okay? The lack of information, which come from the facts that you're not involved, you're not running business, a lot of things you may not know. You, you bear greater liability. So if you really do fall in that position, then am I right to say, as NED, right, you should do something to protect yourself? So, so that even if really, let's say if anything happened to you and then they want to charge you, you do have a defense, you see. You can still say that, hey, hello, you, you know, I, I, I did all these things, you know. And then at the end of the day, well, what can I do? I'm just NED. So there are things that you can do to protect yourself. Now, for example, right, which we'll see. For example, uh, one thing that you must do as an NED to defend yourself from problem is you must not keep your mouth shut. Because if you have anything that you feel is not right, you have to voice it out and you question in the box. You have to ask the directors, I, I have something that I don't understand about the figures. Can you please explain and, and elaborate to me? And if you're not satisfied, then you should pursue the matter. But if you have chosen to keep quiet, now then it makes a lot of difference. So if, if really anything goes wrong, right? Let's say the authority now come and arrest the directors and now they, they take you up for questioning. They want to investigate. The next thing is they're going to ask, so tell me what, what, what is your role over this issue? Are you with them, one gang? Or have you discharged your duty as NED to protect the interests of the shareholder? How do you defend yourself? Is you going to bring in evidence and say, oh yeah, I objected. You know, I, I did my job, I object. Now, how do you prove you objected about something? Okay, what? What record? Better word? Minutes. The minutes must have your your statement like so and so has has read. That's why secretary has to be independent. You imagine you got a comsec that is the same gang with them. Huh? Whatever you say, you object. The fellow purposely don't want to write down. Can happen, huh? It's, it's always happening. Right? Even in actual management meeting, we always see the, the secretary don't take down everything. Right? Sometimes they say, wow, how can I say that they don't have to take down? Huh? Ah, so that, that's the problem. That's why you, you do need an objective secretary. But if you really do have a secretary that refuses to take down what you say, huh? how do you overcome the problem? That's why you see the system is there, right? but just I don't know whether you realize or not. How do you overcome the problem that if you have raised an objection on something, but the, the secretary did not record down. Okay, audio recording could be one. All right. Sorry? They are all one gang. They want to witness for you. Uh. Yeah, witness. Uh, they say, yeah, yeah. The guy is safe with us. All right. uh, so all the witness pull you down. Sack the secretary. Uh. But the problem is it happened already, right? Uh. How do, you, how do you ensure, if you are the only lone guy, la, you are the only good guy, la, the whole gang, all oh, terrible man, la, can you say that? You are the only guy that still has the good heart. How, how do you make sure that you can protect yourself in this case? Okay, run is actually one way that we do. We resign. Resignation is a way of protest. To, to tell people that something is right. That's why we are very careful. La. Whenever we see in actual listed company, directors start resigning. No, no people just resign for fun one month. So if they start resigning, the next thing we're going to ask is, why is this person leaving? Uh, what, what does it tell us? What's the story at the back? Now actually, uh, how do we make sure that everything is recorded, right? Do you realize that before you go on to the next meeting, the first agenda is usually what? The resignation of the director. No. Yeah, yeah, just now you say what? I hear you say last. I pass you the last minute. You, you realize that that's that's why the protocol is like that. Right? Every time you call for a meeting, the first agenda is to look through the previous meeting's minutes and ask for a confirmation. And and you're supposed to confirm the minutes. And you're supposed to sign the, the minutes. Don't sign. Huh? You don't agree, is it? You sign for what? That Malaysian, right? Don't agree, still sign. Huh? Stupid. Okay, huh? That's right. Then you become like Najib. I don't know why I sign. You see, you know? uh, so you don't sign. They can't force you. What? 
Can see or not? So they, they can't force you, just don't sign. Okay? Now, uh, what I've just explained to you is an example of because of the potential liability that you're facing, you really have to make sure that when you serve as NED, you do your job. And not like just go in and sit there and like, like say take free money. Now, if you do that, your risk is going to be extremely high, which is stupid for you to do that. So that's why that, that's what we say. Because of that, the advantage is you get NEDs that they are more accountable, that they will be more involved. Okay, a lot of words you can use here. They can be more effective. And that will result in better governance, better investors' protection because of their role. Okay? Now that, that's actually the main advantage of UniTreeBot. If you look at UniTreeBot, that's the main point. Now, of course, besides that, then they do highlight some other things like, for example, because they are all in the same meeting, it's usually harder for you to filter information from them. You, you know, it, it, I think you can just imagine this. If all of us is going to meet together, whatever we discuss here, you're going to listen. Compare with, I'm just telling you that, okay, first we're going to meet among ourselves and we record down all the things and we report to you what we discuss. Which one do you think you will have better picture? The one you're in. It is like, I can tell my student, I want to join you in the meeting. Or I, I can tell the student that, okay, I'm not going to join you, but you give me the report of what you discuss. Now, which one I'll get better understanding? So it's always when I'm there. So that's why the good thing is you're there. And because you're there, it, it becomes much more difficult for them to take things out, to filter things out. Now, so it will be less likely for things to be excluded Okay, now, and uh, we also believe that the presence of non executive directors can improve shareholders' protection, which can come from many aspects. Uh. Now, one aspect of improved shareholders' protection is basically a magn magnification of what we just said up there. All right, now, the other aspects of protection is the decision making process. that you expect they are more carefully evaluated or they are more carefully considered. All right? They are more carefully evaluated. They are more carefully considered. Uh, indirectly, we are just trying to tell you like more hates are better. Okay? Hello? Now, they, they, I mean, just say a simple thing. Like, let, let's say you want to buy a car. You, you want to buy a Honda. Like, you have made up your mind. Honda, okay? Now, you think and see, if you just talk to one person, hey, what do you think about I buying Honda? Just two of you discuss. Compare if you get 10 people sit down together. At the end of the day, you don't know what car to buy. You probably say, I buy bicycle. Can say that. Because if, eventually, more people will give you a lot different views than what you originally thought. You probably will say, this is why I want to choose this car because it's good in terms of performance. And another guy will come and say, no, 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 you're so wrong. You know? So the, the good thing about having more people in a discussion is the view. Now, what's the drawback of this advantage? Sorry? Time, exactly. Even though you can have a, a more thorough consideration, you also take longer time. Which I give an example of how things can be terrible because of the time they take. Now, so that, that's the main thing of why unitary board is good. We see protection as the main issue. All right? Okay, I, I'm going to come back to just look at the disadvantage in a more uh, overview, summarized manner. Now, I'm going to use the point that Sneha said, time. The, the biggest issue with unitary board is always time. Okay? Now, you expect... very slow decision making all right very slow decision making when you compare 
with a multi-tier board. Okay, now, let's say if you have a multi-tier board, right, we are talking about management board where these are all the EDs. Okay, now, let's say The CEO call for a meeting among the management board members. Let's say there's only like four of them. Okay. Now, the first question is, how fast can you call for a meeting when it only involves executive directors? How fast? I don't want fast. I, I, how fast? Practically. How soon can it be? Let's say today. Today is a Saturday. And then you, you are having a social dinner with somebody tonight. And over the discussion, opportunity comes. You, you know, all opportunity is all come in this way. Right? It, it's rarely like, you, you know, that we go and knock at people's door. It's not like that. It's usually through this like, social event. That's why people say more business and deals are done in the toilet than in the meeting. Because it's only in the toilet, they thought, mm, okay, okay, good, okay, okay, go ahead, come. Now, so so that, that's the thing that we see. So if you've got some ideas over tonight's dinner, and you really think it's brilliant, and, and you want to put this up to the company and say, let's take it up, and you must call for a meeting because you alone will not have the power. How soon you expect that it will take place? Sorry? What, one day, which is Monday, right? Why Monday? Yeah, this is a working day. Most likely, you tell the director that, hey, uh, we're going to have a meeting on Monday. Everyone get ready, be there. Then we discuss. So far of that, go in. And, and it can be like so fast that things can move. You know, even if you want to do further studies, because the people are always there, right? So, so just imagine the speed, practically the speed of doing decision. Okay? It's that fast. Now, Imagine now we have a uni tree board. So the same situation. The CEO wants to call for a board meeting, emergency board meeting, ad hoc one, not planned. Okay? Now assuming that in our board, let's say we have 10 directors, 4 ED, 6 NED, and you want to call them for a meeting? Today is Saturday. How fast can the meeting be? Now, actually, if you say fastest can still be Monday. Lah, because we can still like in the WhatsApp group, hey, can we meet on Monday? But I can tell you practically it won't happen. Right? Because NEDs are what kind of directors? NEDs are what kind of directors? It's a part-time director. Theoretically, we call NED as part-time director. Because they, they don't come every day. Right? They only go when there is a meeting. And usually because I'm a part-time director, I, I need to have a job, you know. If you just become NED, you think I can survive. I die, right? no, 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 you come on. So it's like I will still need to have a proper job. I have my duty to attend to. So if all of a sudden my boss tell me, hey, Monday I have a meeting, I check my calendar, Monday I cannot. Eh? Too rush. Uh, Wednesday, you know when you say Wednesday, another director say cannot. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. You may have to compromise. Then it becomes like one week later. So that, that's already a hurdle to even call for a meeting that not everybody may agree. Now, we, we don't have to call all the directors to be there because the quorum doesn't need all the directors. But you still need enough number of directors to be present. That, then only you can go ahead. Now, that's already one thing, okay? Now, let's say you manage to call all the directors to be present on a much later date. So now the directors are all inside. So what will the CEO do is the CEO will start present them an idea. Now, CEO will say that, okay, we, we have this really good opportunity that can help the companies to increase their value, that can make more profit, blah, 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 and so on, all right? 
Now, of course, CEO finds it, it it's good. He, he will probably say he wants to go ahead, but, but you cannot blame that because we are independent director. Before we agree with you, we will have to think from different perspectives. You know, we, we will be the, the people like they say, act devil, uh, go and cast all the negative things. Uh. We will start asking questions like, what if it's not going to work out? What if it's going to fail? What if this risk is going to pop up? Are you, are you okay? Have you really considered these specs or not? So we're going to ask a lot of things. And, and that's kind of like discouragement. It's like you wanted to buy a Honda and people can't tell you 1,001 reason why Honda is a stupid car. They go, oh, no. It's like really killing you off, right? Because, you know. Now, so that, that itself, it's one issue. Now, but most of the time, that's not another major problem. It's only a discussion. But what goes from there is usually NED, they want to have more assurance that things are all okay before they really want to say it yes. Because as I've told you, NED also need to protect themselves. They, they don't want to be blamed. Now, what is the best way that you, you can protect yourself from being blamed? Human attitude, all like that. Right? Uh -huh. Let's admit, right? They don't even want to admit. They don't even want to appear like it's their fault. Okay, blame people. So you want to blame people. How do you blame people? How do you play this management game that you can blame people? Say you don't know and point finger. Okay, point to who? Huh? So you see, what we normally do is we want to get somebody to, to be involved in that process so that at the end of the day, we try to get the person to take the blame or share the blame. Example, uh, the NED might say, you know, this proposal really looks good, sounds good, but we are still very concerned with the risk. And to be responsible, I think what I would suggest is we want a more independent view. Why don't we just get a consultant and do a study on the proposal and then see what the consultant say. If a consultant say it's really good and go ahead, I think it's a risk worth taking. You know, they may just end up with this kind of story on and get somebody to come in and run through it and see if it's okay. Now, how long more you need to wait to get somebody to come in and study to prepare a report, to deliver on the report. By the time you finish all that, the opportunity run earlier. So the CEO will say, I think it's okay. Huh? Maybe it's not a really good idea anyway. All right? So he just walk out from the room with the tears crying, you know, emoji. Like, zzz, you know? Now, so that, that, that is the very real problem that Uni3 board is always facing. And this problem is more significant with those big, big listed companies when the board is so big. It could be easy like 15 people in the board. 15 people with, for example, it could be only like 3 ED, 12 NED. And you're going to have all that kind of nonsense. Now, that, that frustrates them. So the key problem with Uni3 board is the speed. So that's the main issue, all right? Now, so these are the two things that I highlight to you about the bot structure, okay? So I think that that's good enough already. Now, I'm going to go back to the code that tells you what the code says. So can we please turn back to page 61? Now, Okay, now we are moving towards the non-executive directors. We have thought about the role of a chairman. You know, chairman alone is quite useless, right? Because you, you need to have enough power. So if you just have one chairman alone that is guarding the company, the rest of the people is at the side of the ED, is not enough. So you must give chairman enough bullets to fight. So the people that will be siding the chairman will be the NED. Now, what do you expect NED to do? So this is what the code tells us. The code says that NEDs are expected to discharge a few roles. Now, so it's again from the main and the supporting principle. How many roles do you see that? Okay, the first part in the main principle.
the code tells us that NED should what? Constructively challenge and also help develop proposal on strategy. Now, we, we often call this as a strategy role. Okay? This role concerns strategy. I think it's not very hard to understand, right? What do you mean by constructively challenge? It's like just what, what I say, look. Whatever ideas that you want to table in the board meeting, I will try to look from the angle. Let, let's say, for example, uh, MCKL proposed to start a new program. Okay, a new program. So, Ryan, if you're CEO, a new program you want to start, what will that be? Whatever la, you are the CEO, you can start anything, you can do diploma in, in cleaning or so can la. Can't you have something that is not what we are doing? Something new can or not? Uh, Yvonne say well, do diploma in cooking, culinary arts, okay? Now so she may have an idea, alright? Now if you you are the the non-executive director, you're supposed to throw some challenges about why this may not be a good idea. Exactly. So the first question is, are we even ready? Do we have the place or not? Where are you going to put the gas tank? Explode how? <laughs> Can you know? So you, 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 you know, that, that's your job, alright? That's your job. So you're supposed to constructively challenge whatever proposal that may come from them. Follow? Now, it's not really opposed, eh? Please don't misunderstand. We are not trying to oppose the idea. I mean, then what's the point of having you? Everything they say, you just try to kill it off. Huh? That, that might as well, we don't propose anything. You're supposed to give them different perspective that they may not consider. All right? Now, what about how do you help to develop proposal? You, you can also... Yeah, you can, you can be the one that give them the idea. Right, you might be the one that say, hey, why don't you consider this thing? You know, you, you never thought of that, right? So you can give the idea. And why it may be good for NED to be the one that, that give proposal? Independent. Then? Play active role. Okay, play active role. What about from perspective wise, how will it be different when the NED give idea? Yeah, so that, that's actually a very valid point because you see things from very different angle. You find that, I, I, I mean, for example, I'm people from education. So whatever I say, it, it could be like, my mind is very clouded. But if you get somebody that's coming from totally a different industry, they may see things very differently and, and that idea may just work wonders. You can see, you know? That's why uh, they, they always like to say that usually the people who solve the problem many times are not people in the industry. Like Crocs had a very interesting history. You know Crocs? That, that shoe, that soft, soft one. Uh, who, who invented Crocs? It was a mother. A mother who had a child who doesn't like to wear slippers. So the mother had this problem with the child. Oh, yeah, my son don't want to wear slippers. How to solve the problem? So the mother come up with the idea, make something soft that the child will be more willing to wear it. And that's how she started Crocs. And that was her company. And then after that, she sell Crocs for millions to the company that bought over Crocs. So the solution, thing, if you see Apple got a lot of examples of how they say most of their inspiration doesn't really come from sitting in the office. And sometimes they walk through supermarket and saw kitchen. It's like, hey, what about this problem? And then they thought of something to resolve the issue. So this is where perspective matters. Okay. Now, number two. Eh? Now, non-executive directors should scrutinize the performance of the management in, the, in meeting agreed goals and objectives and monitor the reporting of performance. So what is the main thing you're supposed to do? You are called to? Scrutinize performance. So what do you do exactly in scrutinizing performance? How would you do that? I mean, the first part is probably a discussion over strategy. Like. What about the second part? 
You give me an example of the actual actions that involve scrutinizing performance. In what way that you will do that? Scrutinizing performance. Later we'll come to that. Like, you know, if you become a non-executive director, how do you actually start work? It's like, for example, I employ you as a lecturer, and I say I start, I mean, you start work on 1st of March. You probably will know that on 1st of March, you come to office, and then you sit down, then you start to say, what is my syllabus? You prepare the syllabus, you open up your notes, you, 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 know, you have a set of things in mind. So, what is your expectation when you're appointed as NED? What is your work? What do you do? Uh, how do you how do you actually start? So what is the first day of your work? Do you have an office to go to? Do you have a table to sit down? Then when's the actual day of reporting to work? We'll come to that later, okay? Now, how how do you scrutinize performance? You scrutinize performance is when you discuss over performance of the company, right? And, and when will be the, the opportunity for you to do that? Okay, in meeting. But at what part of the agenda that this is likely to take place? Since when we cover about meeting, there'll be a lot of things you have to discuss. So what will be the agenda item that this is likely to take place? When you follow with what thing? It will be. Now, example, no, he, he say one, not I say, okay? Now, example of one thing that you probably have to do as a director in the board meeting is you have to review their quarterly performance. It, it, it's the job of directors to go through the quarterly performance of the business and approve the, that accounts before you announce it. So, example, uh, when you do a review of quarterly performance, Okay. Now, what do you expect uh, management to provide you when it comes to the review of quarterly performance? What do you want from them to allow you to do the job? Okay, you must give me your quarterly financial result, which shows what you reported as a historical accounting. Now, anything else do you think is good? Like, would you ask management for their forecast? I mean, give me a management account, give me a budget, show me what you expect things going to be in the next three months, six months, nine months. You, you know, all that is very good for me to do assessment of performance. But of course, when you start seeing figures, then you probably will be able to see that, oh, results are dropping. Now, if results are dropping, then what will you do as a director? You're not auditor, you know. Auditors don't care results drop or not drop. Auditors only care whether results wrong or correct. That's why your job as an auditor to come and check the figure whether it's right or wrong. But I'm a director. I don't come and check the figure whether it's right or wrong. I'm more concerned with, wow, this year the sales dropped by another 15%. How will these things go on in the next two quarters? So what are you going to do? Is there a plan? So you must explain to me. Right? Now, that, that's an example of scrutinizing performance. Right? So as you start questioning, you, you know, the idea is very simple. If you are a shareholder, if I show you the accounts now and I show you the results that this is how our profit has dropped, our sales has dropped, things has dropped, what will you say as a shareholder? Let's say this is a shareholder meeting in the AGM. What will you ask? You're going to ask the director the same question. Hey, why drop, man? Huh? Drop how long? Huh? What caused the drop? What are you all going to do? Can you overcome? Am I expecting the same thing for the next two years? You know, you're going to ask this kind of question. Now, you will do the same thing because you are entrusted by the shareholder to do it. Now, that, that's scrutinizing performance. Clear? Huh? Now, if you read on, right, it goes on and says that you should satisfy yourself to the integrity of the financial information The control and the risk management. 
Now, we usually lump all these together as part of the heading called risk. La. Risk and reporting. Okay? Risk. Okay, and then if you read on, it goes on in the last part and says that they are also responsible to make sure that there's appropriate level of remuneration for ED. They have a prime role in appointing where necessary, removing ED and succession planning. Now, uh, the word remuneration, appointing, removing, succession planning, if I'm going to put them under a discipline, or I put them in a, a section inside the company, which department that you, you think all these four words will relate to? HR. You, you see HR, right? You see HR, right? Because you talk about salary, you talk about hiring, you talk about sacking. Now, we usually relate this to the people role. People. I mean, to do with human resources, all right? Now, so you have a job to make sure that the company has a proper risk management system. And your job is also making sure that salary that you pay to directors are appropriate. You're you are appointing the right people into the board. So all that kind of things is what you do. So this is a summary of four things. SSPR. You involve yourself through strategy role scrutinizing role, people role, and risk role. Okay? Okay. Let's look at what the code says in terms of its provision. The provision is quite straightforward. It says that uh, the board should appoint one of the independent NED to be senior independent director. Now, it's only a position. So basically what we do, right? Okay, imagine these are all the NED. Okay, these are all the NED. Now assuming they're all independent, okay? Now of the of the NEDs that you have here, one of the NED will be made as the chairman. It, I, I don't care who, but one of them that you think is suitable will be made as a chairman. Okay. One more NED will be made as SID. It's just a position that we give them. It's like a deputy chairman or like an assistant chairman. Like that. But we don't call it deputy chairman. We call it a senior independent director. Okay? So you have a different title. Alright? You have a different title. Now, but you're going to ask like, why do we want to have people of different titles? Because the title gives you the role, is like, for example, if you make class monitor, the, the moment they call you class monitor, do, do you naturally realize that you behave quite differently? It, it's a work rule. Because once you're given a title, you realize that you live up to what you're called. That's why once I, I name you chairman, you are, I'm a chairman, you know, so I, I must be like a chairman. So that's why I, I don't want to just call all of you independent director. So we give that title. Now, why do we want to do it like that? Because to us, we, we always worry that if one person fail in their job, there should be another person. That, that's our mindset. That's why accountants are very prudent. One. They always think like if this guy is useless, at least there's another guy. Now, that, that is the other guy. That's why they say, this senior independent director will usually be available to shareholder. Now, if you read all that, you should understand what it says. Huh? That if they have concerns which contact through the normal channels of the chairman, the CEO, and other directors fail to resolve the issue. See, you know, they say if you try to talk to the chairman, nothing come out. You try to talk to the CEO, nothing come out. Okay, then try to talk to the SID. Okay, so it's like having an avenue for you to lobby things. Now, that's it. Okay, now go to the next page. Huh? Now, this is what I've highlighted to you the last class, that chairman should hold meetings with NED. So please tie this back to the role of the chairman on how you can facilitate contribution of NED. 
the contribution of NED. Now, so we're going to ask one question. From what you studied last week, you know that chairman is so critical, right? If you really have a useless chairman, the governance system can really go down the drain. It's so important. Now, what if we really have such a useless chairman in the company? How then? I mean, you cannot discount the possibility that the guy is terribly useless. So what is that mechanism for the company to actually overcome this kind of issue? How do you resolve that? Now, that's why the code even take into account that there might be a possibility you don't get the best chairman. So this is a solution. That's why they suggest, they say, the SID, now you see the, the deputy, the SID, must do what? Together with the rest of the non-executive directors will meet without the chairman. To what? To appraise the chairman's performance. Now, why must the court say that? So you can do it. Okay? Now, imagine, imagine, this thing is not in the court. Alright? This thing is not in the court. And you really have a useless chairman. And, and I try to be the hero to solve the company's problem. So I call the rest of the independent directors and say, hey, let's have a meeting and see how we can address the issue. Our chairman, Ray Taboli, uh, now, if I do it on my own accord, on my own initiative, how would people label me? Yeah, but to Api, I'm the one that's trying to play behind people's back. I'm trying to do politics. Why, what are you trying to do? Huh? Now, why are you calling meeting behind me? Huh? See, you see the difference or not? But now, uh, I do it openly. Because I do it on the basis that I have to do it. The code says what? So every year, we plan for a meeting and tell the chairman that it's part of the requirement, you know, that all of us have to meet without you to discuss you, all right? And the chairman will have to accept that. So, so that becomes a system that allows things to happen. Which is why the court has to say, now that's why end of the day, you see, at the end of the day, you can always choose not to do that. That's why it's comply or explain. So end of the year, the company must come up with a statement and say, to what extent you comply with all these things. Okay, so one of the requirements is they must have a meeting. SID with NED without the chairman. Okay, this year, I never had that meeting. Now, then I will have to report and tell the shareholder we never had the meeting, so we did not comply with the code. Okay, give me the reason. Why didn't you do it? What is your justification that you do not need to have that meeting? So, explain. Okay, I can give you a reason. The chairman is new. He was just appointed. He's only in service for the last four months. I don't think it's fair to appoint praise a person's performance in just such a short time of four months. That's why we don't think it's necessary, so we never call for a meeting. That's why we never comply. Uh, if you're a shareholder, can you accept my reason? Or you think I'm nonsense? I mean, it's up to you. Like, if you think I'm nonsense, you score us. Huh? You see, you say, mm -hmm. okay, that makes sense. Okay, then you allow that. See, you know, the flexibility is there because of this approach called comply or explain. Now, that, that's what they are preaching, which is in UK. La. They see this as one of the important things. Now, carry on. Eh? Now, just now I've told you that S and E D, right? You need to protect yourself from this added liability. Okay? You have to protect yourself from this liability. How do you protect yourself from this liability? Now, we did discuss some of the issues here, but my as well, I'm just going to write down since we are here. See, the court tells us when directors are concerned that cannot be resolved about running of the company or a proposed action, what do you mean by concerns that cannot be resolved? Meaning something that you oppose. All right? Something you oppose. For example, my CEO say want to start diploma in cooking. Now, I find that's a terrible nonsense. I don't think it's a good idea, although all other directors say it's excellent. 
I'm alone. I'm the only person who don't believe in that. So I, I think that my concern is not resolved because you guys decided to go ahead, you see. Now, when you have a situation like that, see what it says? Make sure concerns are what? Recorded in the minutes. It will be used as an evidence, you know, which is actually what happened even in practice. There's an example, uh, if there's any scandal, uh, you know NED has been sent to jail before? The, f the first time in Malaysia NED sent to jail was this fraud that involved a company called Transmau. If you Google, you can find one. Transmau. Transmau, it's a, it's a company, I think it implicates one of our ministers those days. I don't know whether you still remember this name, Ling, Ling Leong Sik. Don't remember. No la, that one Choi Chua Soi Lake. Okay? You don't simply say people got sex scandal, la, okay? Uh, but anyway, it's, it's very old, la, okay? He's very old. He he retired much earlier, even before Mahathir stepped down, he retired. Uh, so he know his time is up, he quickly go first and enjoy his life. That's why you see when you leave at the right time, nobody care about you and Timing is everything. Okay, anyway, this was a company involved with transport, just like a, a courier company. Uh, and they claim they have a lot of aeroplane. Can you believe the fraud is like that? They claim they have a lot of aeroplane, but actually they don't have the aeroplane one. So the account shows that they have 50 aeroplane, uh, but actually they only have two aeroplane. How do you cheat the auditor? You show someone so if I show you my account, I got 50 car, and you will trust me just because I bring you to a car park? So, yeah, because the auditor also nonsense, uh, useless, uh. the auditor didn't check properly, alright, so uh, anyway, don't talk about that, okay? So, so that was a, a very good example that two non-executive directors sent to jail. So NED went to jail because of their failure of discharging their duty, all right? And what they do is they go through the minutes. So actually, you see, if you have done your job, right, you may not need to go to jail, you know? Like if you have opposed, you, you've actually, like, uh, um, uh, a check on something and then everything is recorded, shows that you did your part, you'll be okay. Now, that's what you do. You make sure that it's recorded. Now, if you keep going on and you realize that the issues persist, Especially when you have the only guy in the board, the only sober guy that the mind is clear about, this is wrong, but the rest are all like one gang. Now then you really leave yourself with no choice. You must do what? Resign. Okay? Now let me ask you a question. Have you all learned interview letter in your life? I mean, a, a job application letter in your life? Have you learned how to write, how to apply for a job in school? I mean, not, not resume, the letter, the cover letter, how to apply for a job. Surat Pemohonan Jawatan. Don't say I learned in Bahasa Melayu. Okay? Job application. Never learn. Ah. Your school never teach you how to apply a job. Ah. Wala, chia la. How are you going to get a job in the future? Wow, new, wow, new, wow, new generation is like... Hey, you have to give me the job, you know, hello. What job application letter? You don't hire me, can I want you know what? Sorry, I I that's why I'm one generation older than you all, okay? Now but what I want to stress is most of the time we learn how to apply job. We never learn how to resign. Yeah, throw letter, but have you learned how to write that letter? Yes. How to write resignation letter? Ah, so, so I tell you, ah, the, the resignation letter all sound like that one. Uh, boss, unfortunately, with a deep and regret heart, I would like to tender my one-month notice or three-month notice of resignation. I feel so happy to serve in your company, your esteemed company, where I have learned so much experience, which have valued me so much in my life, all right? It's really, really unfortunate that I have to leave this job because of my personal commitment. If not, I would have wished to stay on. And boss, you have taught me so much. I really value it. Wow, you write all that kind of big thing. Uh. 
<laughs> Actually, you just want to say one thing only. Boss, you're terribly nonsense. I don't like you. You're so frustrated. I, I see your face also. I feel like whack you. And that's the reason why I resign. But you won't tell the truth. Huh? Now, and why I highlight this to you is because it's so true that even as a director, when they resign, they have to give a reason. Huh? You look at all the resignation in Malaysia. Lah. Malaysia. Okay. Actually, everywhere is the same. I have never come across one resignation of director that the reason is because of a problem in the company. They have never said that, oh, because of this issue, that's why I resigned. If you see all the resignation letter, they either say, pursue personal interest, retirement. Personal reason. They won't tell you what reason. Huh? Now, that's so stupid of us to do that. So remember, if next time you become NED, if you think the company's got problem, when you resign, you write the reason. Because if anything, go to court, right? The judge take out the letter and read. In the resignation, you never say got problem? You somehow say thank you for the valuable experience? <laughs> you see, no? so, so you have to be truthful. Now, that is why they say, on resignation... You must give a statement of why you resign. You give it to the chairman. It's very important defense that you, you will have at the end of the day if anything goes wrong. You must do that. Give a reason of why you resign. Okay? Whether they want to publish that, that's their problem. Really. But you must tell that I'm not happy with certain things that's going on in the company. Now, that's two things. Huh? Okay. One here, two here. Now, number three, as part of protecting yourself, uh, uh, one of the things you are asked to do is to seek amplification. Uh, basically, is to seek clarification. Or we say to ask question. Okay, to seek clarification to ask question. Okay, so this is the first part that they say, the role of NED. How many things you must do? Four things, huh? Strategy, scrutinizing, people, risk. So I've elaborated for you. Now, carry on, huh? Now, this is the part that they will start discussing about nomination, okay? So section B, we are entering into process of appointing director. Appointing director. Now, nomination committee comes in. Okay. Now, we're going to run through a couple of items that concerns with appointment and nomination. And uh, because the, the code is like everywhere, okay, so I will first uh, make the first point with you. Okay. The main principle says that the board and its committee should have the appropriate balance. Now, we're going we're gonna to stress on the point first. Uh, appropriate balance. Now, and you must ask yourself, okay? You gotta ask yourself in terms of what? Now, what kind of balance? Okay, what kind of balance? What kind of balance? You know, it's like people come to you and say, hey, you must have a balanced life, you know. Okay, what do you mean by I must have a balanced life? You know, you, when you just say balanced life, I cannot see what you're trying to say. Maybe you tell me my life is too much of work and you want me to cut down and give some time for God and give some time for family. You, you know, maybe that's one thing you say about balance. Maybe balance in terms of maybe 
the circle that I have. So there's a lot of factors that you want to say what kind of balance. Now, same thing. If you, if you come to tell me that you must have a balanced board. Okay, what kind of balance? Now, there are actually various types of balance. Uh. If, if you read these, they say. Now, I'm going to highlight all the keywords first. Then I'll explain. You must talk about balance of skills experience. Now, skills, experience, knowledge, I think they belong to the same category. Okay? But I think independent will not belong to the same category. I don't think you talk about balance or independent together with balance of skill. So they don't belong to the same category. Okay? Okay. And then it goes on and says that the board should have sufficient size. Now, balance of size is also a kind of balance, right? The balance of skill, balance of independent, balance of size. Okay? Now, Then it goes on in the next paragraph that the board should include appropriate combination of ED and NED. Now, ED and NED, it's actually the same with balance of independent. Would you agree? Because when you talk about NED, you, you will talk about independent director. So that's why in this case, I think these two type of balance are, are more or less the same. Balance of ED, NED. Now, then it goes on and tells us about refreshing of membership, then they talk about the, the committee chairmanship and so on, which I will not touch on the balance yet. That's not relevant to the balance. Now, coming to the next page, I'm, I'm discussing with the same matter. We are still talking about balance. Now, it goes on and says that supporting principle, the search for board candidates should be conducted and appointments be made on merit against objective criteria with due the regard to the benefit of diversity. Now, diversity is a kind of balance that we should take into account. How diverse is your board? Okay? Now, and, then, and then it goes on and it repeats. It says that your board should have balance of skills and experience. Okay, so I need to jump out from here and discuss this. Okay. We have just been told by the court, uh, okay? Now, we have been told to maintain a balance board. That's what the code tells us, okay? We've been told to maintain a balance board. Right, so the next thing that I need to look at is one. When you say a balance board, what does it mean? which I have actually highlighted some of the criteria of balance board according to the code. Okay? So what do you mean by balance board? So what characteristics? Now, before we look at that characteristic, can I know who will be the one that will take up the role of maintaining balance board? You've you, you, you got to have somebody to be in charge, right? Correct not? You've got to have somebody to be in charge to make sure that you have a balance board. So who will you pass the task to in the board? That the duty is to make sure that the board is balanced. Shareholder. How shareholder can do that? Chairman, that everything back to chairman as well, right? Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, nomination seems to be one of the more wiser people to do it. Now, so who is tasked to, to ensure that the balance is there is often nomination committee. Okay? 
Okay. Well, I don't think it's actually uh, important because then we, we become very mechanistic now. Because And you know that we, we don't expect you to be mechanistic in SBL. But it's no harm to roughly know like what are the structure of a nomination committee. So can I just get you to read this part? If you go to page 64, right? Okay, page 64. Can we read B2.1 where the code tells us about nomination committee? Okay, let's read this. Huh? There should be a nomination committee which lead the process for board appointment and they make recommendation to the board. So ultimately, they don't decide one. Always remember, committee never make decision. The decisions always come from the board. But the board themselves will not know what is the best to do. That's why they needed advice. And the committee is the one that gives the advice by giving recommendation. Now, read on the next, next line. It says what? A majority members of the nomination committee should be independent, non-executive directors. The chairman or an independent entity should chair the committee. But the chairman should not chair the nomination committee when it is dealing with the appointment of the successor to the chairmanship. Now, so what kind of nomination committee that we are expecting? Number one, how many people do we need in the nomination committee? I'm not trying to be mechanistic, as I say, but it's good to at least have, a, have some concept of what the code tells us so we know the rationale behind. How many people do we need in the nomination committee? Five or six. What does the code say? Huh? Yeah, the code never actually say how many. So meaning you have a free hand. You say, oh, can I have three people? Up to you. Can I have two people? Up to you. Can I have one? No, la. one how to call committee. You see, okay. So two or three is okay. Five is okay. It's really up to you. So the code never really imposed the number of people. So there is no minimum number. Now, but whatever number of directors that you appoint to sit inside the committee, the criteria is they must be what? Majority independent. And the chair of nomination committee is who? Because every committee needs to have a chairman one. Huh? And, and take note, the chairman of the committee is not the chairman of the board. The chairman of the board chairing the board. This is the chair of the committee, which, of course, you lead the committee. So who can chair the nomination committee? Now, the court tells us they don't mind the chairman of the company to chair the nomination committee. But do you know when you have a chairman of the company to chair the nomination committee, that means you are making the chairman becoming more... Powerful. That's why we always ask the questions. Can a chairman chair audit committee? Can a chairman chair remuneration committee? Can a chairman chair nomination committee? Now, in terms of compliance, you need to know that. Right? But the court seems to allow the chairman to chair the nomination. But the only thing you cannot do is when it comes to your own position, then you cannot chair. Okay? Now, but they allow that. So I highlighted what the court says to you. Now, when the court says majority can be independent, right? Instead of using majority, usually the court will use the word, I think you have learned this, right? Normally you talk about committee, they will say what? They don't use the word majority, they like to use the word. What's the word? Simple three letter word. Normally, when they talk about the membership in the committee, it's a very simple three-letter word. The word is all. A-L-L. -L, all. Most of the committee that you learn, they will stress all member must be independent. All. 
all member in the audit committee must be independent. All member in the remuneration committee must be independent. But why here they say majority? What's the difference? Meaning? Okay, they allow ED to come in. Now, that means here they give a leeway that they allow ED or they allow a non-independent NED to come in. Why would the court allow that? What, what is it that the court is seeing that they would want you to allow an ED to be in this committee? Why, why, why don't just they force everybody to have everyone to be independent? But why would they want to allow you to have ED to, to sit in the committee? What's the rationale behind? What do they see? What's the value? Okay, if you want to have one ED in the committee, who else that you will put it in? Which ED that you will want him to be? Most likely? Okay, CEO, probably you have CEO to sit in the committee because he's the most senior ED. Now, I'm not saying it must be. Uh, I'm just saying most likely you will have the CEO to sit in the committee. But why would you want to have that? Okay, if the ED involved in business, so, so. So that's the rationale. Because they may be better off in terms of choosing the people that really can serve well in the company. They know the needs. Ma. The independent data may not know the needs, you see. But, but it doesn't mean that you must be there. Even if you have all the director independent, I, I can still achieve the same objective. The only difference is instead of uh, having the CEO as a member, I can invite the CEO to join the meeting to give your input, la. but the only thing is you cannot vote on it. You see the difference? I, I still can call the CEO. Okay, now we're going to have a discussion over getting a CFO for the company. So three independent directors of the nomination committee is going to meet. But I can call the CEO to come in. La. CEO, please join us. Now, what do you think about all these candidates? Now, then when it comes to actual voting, right, you cannot vote. La. That's the only difference. Okay? Now, but you can see that they give some leeway Perhaps it's because of what you said. The CEO may be a good person to give their input what kind of people that we might need. Okay. Now, nomination does that. And one of the main things that we just said is nomination has to maintain board balance. Now, we're going to explore to, to expand on this point. When it comes to maintaining board balance, the role of maintaining board balance Now, we tell ourselves, uh, what kind of balance? If not, you find it very hard to expand your answer. So you first tell yourself, what kind of balance that you're seeing? What kind of balance? Now, how many balance that we have seen so far? Okay, balance of skills. Skills, knowledge, all right, experience. Okay, it's your job to make sure that the board has the right people in terms of skills, knowledge, experience. Now, now go further. How do you make sure that will be that that will happen? Because it's your job to make sure that the board made up of people with the right skill. So. How do you make sure that that will happen? Okay, you interview them. So now I got five people here. Okay, let's say now uh, this one, two, three, four, five, five. Which one you choose? Okay, ask for your resume. What do you want to see? See their background. Okay, see their background. Then how do you choose from the background? So you are close to answer, but you have not hit my point. How do you know? They are now five CV. All five of them very different. Different background, different skill. Yeah. Okay, you are quite similar to what he's trying to say, but you still miss out one important thing. Important. Sorry? The qualification that you, that you need. You, you know, how do you know what balance of skills or experience until you first define what you need? 
It, it's not a simple thing, you know. Now, example, uh, in one organization, what kind of skills that you will need? Okay, let's talk about CFO. You give me an example. Accounting background. Okay, define clearly. Accounting background, what kind of qualification? How many years experience? Experience in what field? What level of capacity they have served? All these things is very important. What? You just say accounting qualification. Then you also can become CFO. <laughs> Correct, no? Now, all these things are very important. So let me ask you a question. Have you got all these things written out? So that when five people sit here, I can tell you in these five, who are the one qualified, who are the one not qualified. Because you need to base on something. Ma. Now, that's why your job as a nomination is to produce what we call job specification and job description. You must go through a process of preparing that. Now, you have to prepare JDJS. Job description, job specification. All right. Now, job description is like you say, like, like what well, I've just told you, what kind of qualification, what kind of experience, uh, what kind of capacity that you have served before. That, that's called job description. Job specification is more of the feature of the job. For example, this job requires traveling. Okay? This job requires you to work in the night. Now, that's the specification of the job. And, and when you start telling people the specification of the job, it may not fit certain people. Right? For example, uh, like if you want to become ACC lecturer, the first thing I tell you is you, you give up all your Saturday. They can say, oh, I cannot. Saturday very important. Okay, then, then sorry, uh, you cannot take the job. Eh? Because the specs of the job is every Saturday you got to work. Every evening you got to work. Because of me teaching 20 years, I got no friend virtually. Right? Because every time when my friend come out, I cannot come out. So imagine for the for the last 10 years, if every time got people do gathering, I also miss. You think they will still call you again? Nobody will call you. So it's very lonely life to be a lecturer. You know? Sad, man. Very, very sad. Now, okay, back to this. So you prepare JD, JS, so you know what kind of skills you need. That's why during the interview, you're able to assess like, okay, this is the person that I need and so on. Okay, let, let's say you've got that. Now, what is the next thing that will help you in this task about skill and knowledge? Do you think skills will remain the same? No change? Or do you think along the way, you're going to have a different kind of skills that you need? It, it, it evolves, right? Because business is growing. So today, I may not need so much of computing skill, but now I think I'll need a lot of computing skill. So the skills that we need will become different. So let me ask you, so if you've got a director, for example, you've got a director, very conventional. He don't know much about digital stuff. And now you think digital stuff is getting more important. So what do you do with the director? Sega. Wow, very unmerciful, man, you Okay, so training could be one example. So, so you see, what you can do could include proposed training. Now, it may be as simple as two words, but it can be so difficult to do. Because, example, uh, you must have a training assessment matrix. What kind of training that your staff need? Where are they going to get the training? How do you assess that the training has been effective? You know, all these things is not easy, I know. So it may sound so simple, like training, training. Because, you, know, you just say training. But at the end of the day, to even come up with a plan to send directors and senior management to the right training and assess that they have gained from the training is a task job. A, a, a hard job, can you know? So that that's your role. That's why you need to make sure that your committee are able to do all that for the company. Okay. Now, so we've looked at skills. Okay. So good enough. One. Now, what's the other thing that you need besides skills? Size. Okay. Balance of size. Uh, what it means by balance of size that they are saying is basically the number of director, right? So we are talking about the number of director. 
Okay, what's wrong if the company has too many data? Slow decision, yeah, cost. Cost is a very prominent thing, you know. Because every director costs money. I mean, depending on what kind of director. Lah. Because if you're talking about ED, it's, it's going to cost even more. Now imagine one ED. Let's say I get a very senior position. How much do you think we should pay a senior member of the management? Wow. CEO probably won't earn so much. Oh. Don't work so big, ah, the company. So big, man. So fast, 200k. Okay. Per annum is still a lot, you know. More, less, less than that, lah, about 15-16,000 a month. Lah. It's still a lot, you know. Okay, ah, yo. now I feel myself so poor, MD man. Huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Normally, MD is, 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 MD is like CEO like that. Lah. Yeah. I mean, depending on the size of the company. Lah, okay? if, if, if you are quite reasonable size listed company, 1-2 million a year is quite normal. Lah. No, no lah. Cannot say at all. Depending, a company cannot make money. You can take so much, man. So at the end, it's still back to performance, lah. Okay. Now, actually, actually, the the thing about salaries, lah, I, I must teach you a skill next time when you go interview. You must know how to demand your salary. Okay. Because surely your interviewer asks you, how much are you expecting? Okay. How much are you expecting? Let's say a job. You say three thousand, okay? Let's say three thousand or three thousand five. Now, interviewer probably will tell you, uh, I think what you're expecting is a bit too high com compared to what we are looking at. Can you negotiate down your salary or not? Yes, you know. How do you respond? <laughs> Voila. That's why you're all so ordinary, man. You must tell them. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your time. Okay. <laughs> Wow, terrible. I cannot, uh, you're like that. Must tell the person, the value that you pay me is reflective of the value that I give. So when I ask for 3,005, I'll make sure that I'll work more than 3,005 for your organization. So Try. Huh? Your high. Why? No, I. I, I, I lose every time. I. <laughs> I'm a charity man. <laughs> All right? I do a lot of charities. I come, okay, serve, don't take salary. Okay? But seriously, you, you know, it's so hard that in an interview, we usually find that there are people that, uh, uh, not demand, but they really know how to uh, answer the right manner in the right confidence. So, so sometimes when you give this kind of answer, you really make the interviewer say, that's something quite unique about you. But at the end of the day, whatever you say, don't be overconfident. Be a bit humble. Okay? Humble is very important. Huh? Don't, don't feel like you know everything in the world. Okay, so too many directors, your income, I mean, your cost is too high. So like I say, I, I, imagine one senior position. All right? You pay 20000 You increase your cost by 240000 you know. Before you take into account all the social insurance, that means EPF, so 240 plus everything, it could be easily 300,000. So you got to carry 300,000. How long do you carry 300,000? Till they retire. Till they retire. Do you know in employment, usually it's very hard for us to sack a person. Because what basis do you sack me? That's why, that's why it's very funny. One. In our employment contract, there's, there's always this clause that says that you give three months notice. Now, this three months notice is good for the employee or the employer or both? No, it's employee. It's very unfair. Okay, it's employee. Because if your boss gives you three months notice and terminate you, you can take action against your boss for an unfair dismissal. Now, let me ask you a logical question. If giving notice is workable, right, why does company have retrenchment exercise where they offer compensation for you to take up? They should have just used notice and serve what? Now, I give you a notice three months, all of you can get lost. They cannot learn. Because this is against the welfare of the people. The employer is not so simple. So once you take a starver, you probably have to carry him for life, you know. And if he's a liability, then how? You're going to carry a burden with you. Now, that's the reason why for director, we have to be very careful. So how do we solve that problem? 
Uh, that's why you see in the code, they will say that director will be appointed for a period. That's why a contract is needed. Like one year and then renew. So at least if you find that guy is not good, you don't renew him. Then he will have to leave. Okay? Now, so too many directors is too costly. Too, too little director, what's the problem? Not enough director, what's the problem? Yeah, not, I mean, chances is people will be overworked already, right? You've got to like lump everything all together on one person to do a two, three people's job. Now, effectiveness is definitely going down. So the size is critical for all that. Too big is a problem, too small is a problem. Okay, now, now what's your job now as nomination? Now, of, of course, your job includes assessment. Okay? Your job includes assessment. You, you, you got to understand the nomination is not just dealing with the director. You know. You're also dealing with the senior management level that you normally will oversee and give them advice. So how many managers do you need in a company? That, that kind of question. So how many directors will you need? How do you justify why we need one more executive director? What is your basis? So do, do you have a way of measuring another? That, that's your job of assessing the needs. Now, and of course, through the assessment of needs, you then can give recommendation, which include, you may tell that uh, a, a new position to be created, you may recommend to appoint. You may also recommend not to reappoint, not to reappoint. Or you may also recommend to remove a director. Now, th these are examples of things that you can do in terms of size, okay? Okay, what other balance that you say is not? What other balance? Faster, faster, we want to go for a break, Eddie. Faster, faster. What other balance? Okay, balance of ED and NED. Now, th this is straightforward. Normally, code will insist that we must have certain proportion of ED and NED, right? Okay? Now, the, the normal standard of number of NED is what? Yeah, usually they will just say the number of NED is more than the ED, right? So that, that, that idea is like that, lah, okay? Now, we'll come to what the actual code says. Again, I, I'm not bothered about the actual detail because that's too mechanistic. So we just want a concept. So the NED more than ED. Now, not NED more than ED. Not NED. What is the more proper phrase? Independent NED. It's, the, it's not the NED. It's the independent one. So normally, they will insist that the independent NED more than ED. Because you can have non-independent NED. Okay? Now, ED definitely not independent one. Because they are already in part of the management. So only the NED can be independent, but you can have non-independent NED. Now, so the idea is the independent NED more than ED. Okay, then what is your job then? What is the, the thing you have to do in terms of this? To make sure that the independent NED more than ED. Of course, one thing is you make sure that the people that you appoint, that's why you probably will say, okay, we need uh, seven independent director against, let's say, three executive director. Okay, fine. You, you've got seven against three. Let's say uh, you started with seven independent director against three executive director. You have the people already. Okay, you have. So do you have the right balance? You, you got the balance, right? Okay, what will be the next thing that will happen? Let's say one year later. One year later. Now, what will you do one year later? Directors will probably have to retire, right? Now, we'll come to that later. Right? Directors have to retire. And when directors retire, what do you do is you reappoint them. You can get them to come back. Now, but when they come back, the next questions we're going to ask is what? Are they still independent? Now, that, that's why it's your job to assess the 
independence of the NED. Okay, your job here is to assess the independence of the NED. And in order for you to do that, then you have to know what are the circumstances that, that cause a director to lose his independence. Why are you less independent? Is there any factors? Example, if this NED and the CEO, they are good friends, would you think that's a factor? Sorry? Or they already close friends? So does close friend affects independent? Yes, yes. Then how do you define friend and how close is close? So if if a a woman sleep with you, close or not? Close or then prostitute close or not? Can I answer? Huh? Prostitute close. What well, SBI you learn about prostitute also? <laughs> wow, Mr. Ng, Mr. Ng. <laughs> so, so now I'm I'm just trying to throw you an example of how difficult it will be to define closeness in relationship. For example, like my relationship with you. Can you call my relationship with you is close just because you are my student? I I don't know. All right, I don't think all of you are so close with me. Even though you may feel you're very close with me, also, I may not feel that, right? You can see, you know? so, so, or vice versa. So, you see, it's so hard for that to be defined. That's why if you want to use friendship, I think it's going to be difficult. How are they going to define that? Now, that's why they can't. So, on paper, they cannot say that having friendship affects independence. Have you ever learned that in your audit? No. How, how does audit define relationship problem? Give me an example of a relationship that can, can impair auditors' independence. Family. Family, very easy to define, right? Are you my family member? No. Can I be confused? Cannot, because it's so clear, right? Now, what other relationship that can be very clear? Employee, employer. If you work with me, you had a business relationship. Now, that one can be very clear. So, as I think that they are very clear, it, it can be defined. So, you see, the problem is, now we're back to one concept that we learned about ethics, rules and principles. On rule, if we are close friend, are we independent? Yes, because the rule never say friend affects independent. But in principle, are we independent? Now, the essence of it is not, right? See, see that, that, that's always a difficult thing that we had when dealing with this kind of issue. Now, but we will see later, if you want to assess independent, you must know the criteria or the characteristics. And that goes back to what we discussed last Thursday when they say that chairman has to be independent. I'll, I'll remind you about that shortly, okay? Okay, what's the fourth thing that we have about balance? Diversity. You know, diversity is like one of those new emerging matter that, that people like to touch on. Because nowadays, people like to talk about things like fairness, being equal. Okay, uh, you give me an example of diversity. What? Okay, that's gender diversity. Lah, okay. Gender diversity. Uh, what other diversity? Okay, race or nationality. Some more? Okay, age. Faith. Is faith diversity? Like people of different faith can also, right? Okay. Now, uh, basically, the, the main diversity nowadays that people talk a lot is gender for some. Because they, they always find that these are stereotype thinking is a lot. Like only male can be better, female is not so good, that kind of stuff, okay? 
Okay, uh, why is diversity important? What do you get when you have a diverse group of directors or senior management? What do you tend to, to derive from it? Okay, perspective. What else? Do you get different form of chemistry? If, 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 if you just imagine, if the whole board of directors are all men, and suddenly you bring a young girl inside the board, what will happen? Uh? <laughs> what charm? What? Hey, hello, director, you think what? Director monster, man. Alright? <laughs> That's why, uh, that, that means you're saying director are monster. Uh. Hello. Hey, we are very professional, okay? I'm very disappointed with your statement. <laughs> I will sue you on the basis of discrimination. <laughs> Corporate what corporate bullying, all right? Now, I'm trying to say we'll get so excited. Be, and, and please, don't get me wrong. Excited is because we can get a different view. We can listen to something so we never hear before, right? Even the, the tone is so different because the girl tone, the pitch is different. The conversation is so nicer. Already. My point is to make it better. No, ah, you're one very one discriminating. Ah. Okay, now, so... You, you, you do see the fact that diversity can bring a lot of different uh, chemistry to the working dynamics. The perspective, can you see it on? Uh, what other things that diversity can bring? Okay, I, I usually do one experiment. Yeah, let, let me find my own notes first. Huh? Uh, yeah, where is it? Uh? Okay, I'm going to show you some photo. What advertisement do you think is this? Yeah. Oh, you know, you saw my file name, is it? Switch out the light. So serious, man. Very hard to see on the back. Switch out the eyes. Okay, uh, this is one of the advertisements by Ikea. Yeah, Something is wrong with the picture. What is Chinese boy there? Wow, you very racist, leh. Yeah, is it Chinese? Where don't say Chinese, girl. Where is the Chinese boy? Just like you say. Yeah, this is problem. Uh, say what I don't like. What is wrong with this picture? The house is not even glamorous, yes. The mistake is the word image buyer IKEA is still there. No la, yo. That's, that's not the problem la. You want me to zoom bigger for you to see? I want to go bigger. I want to go bigger. Cannot. Can't be already. Oh, the dollar sign should be higher. Oh, this is Singapore ad. Sorry. <laughs> Fine, yeah. Something with the cup. Yeah, the, the cup got no drink. Yeah, and the plate got no food. Yes, that's so right. Okay. Yeah, fine. Yeah. Okay. Now, huh? Okay, got tips. Ah, got got. Okay. Uh, you guess the designer behind this advertisement. What race is the designer? Oh, black man. Black man. Ah. 
you, you, I think I can't go into your world, man. Why not? Why black? Because all the Philippines are, all the hip hop, hip hop thing, uh, the culture is from there, man. Black, black, go like man? Huh? Huh? Oh, really? Uh? The Negroes like the, gold. The, the, the breath, the breath is gold. Oh. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, now I, I find that I thought this might be a Chinese designer who has a strong value in the in the concept of Chinese New Year and trying to blend together with Hari Raya. Because you, you see the sad thing about Chinese, right? is they always think about money. Even the wish is Gong Si Fa Cai. I wish you be rich. I mean, hello, nonsense. It's all about money, you can see or not? Then when you, when you toast the Yi Sang, Hwala, Ong, everything is money, money, wow, money, prosperity, money. It's all about money. That, that's why the Chinese culture believe when it's a new year, you must buy new clothes. Because new clothes will bring new luck. New luck gives you new prosperity. And it's about more money. It's all money. Now, I, I, I suspect that because when it comes to design the Raya advertisement, the designer also bring the concept about bling bling. Bring new things. New furniture. New prosperity. That's the concept. Now, you probably won't see the problem until you read. You say, wow, I didn't realize there's so much problem, man. Have you realized that you didn't consider all this just now? Like, like yeah, la, I, I never thought of that. I just thought it's a normal advertisement. It's normal, you know? Now, so uh, this is an example of why uh, diversity could have overcome the problem. If you have got people that come of different backgrounds, then they would have got different perspective to the issue. Then they probably will tell you like, hey, you know, that's actually not the right way of doing things. So sometimes because we look at issues at one angle, we overlook and at a lot, a lot of other things and then things about sensitivity has always been overlooked. And then, you, you know, that's the, the way the problem comes. And, and the problem nowadays is worse is because internet has been a platform for people to judge you and then when when generally people say you are wrong you, you end up be guilty all right because they go by the wave one you see, you see like like uh, example this case where the doctor scold the patient you, you know not? that recently the one person record the doctor then the doctor shout and tell the patient you get out you cannot wait you get out you see not? then then that woman take the the video and put up in the internet and it became viral. And then when it became viral, people just say that the woman is wrong. And everybody start blaming the woman. So you see, these is the, the issues that we're having. So that's why nowadays, uh, the management of reputation risk is very, very tough. One. That's why if you do not know how to take care of all these things, it may end up a big disastrous problem for the company. So uh, we will study all these things in the future as part of risk management. But uh, I think that that's a good example of how diversity uh, could have helped you to overcome these kind of uh, mistakes because you might get views of different angles. Okay. Okay. So uh, if you think diversity is important, what can you do as a nomination committee? What will you consider for this? Example, see the lights off already, you all want to sleep. Give me an example, what would you do as part of diversity? Change the job description, come on. 
That's not a job description. Right? Job description usually don't put that kind of thing in. When you put that kind of thing in, you're so discriminative with it. It's like you must only for Chinese speaking uh, applicant. Which again, nowadays people will will use that as an issue against you. Now, uh, what you can do is you can have a diversity policy. The company may come up with a diversity policy. Uh, do, you, do you come across any form of diversity policy in Malaysia? Yeah, so that, that's a very typical example of diversity policy. Like Malaysia, the government said like minimum 30% must be female. Uh, we also have the, the national economic policies that say like 30% of the shareholder must be a Bumi Putra. You, you know, that's an example of diversity. Even when you have that, it doesn't mean that you overcome the problem. It's still open up for criticism. But for example, when they say minimum 30% of the member at the senior level must be women. So if I have 10 people there, lah, you can see 3 must be women, right? 7 are male. So 3 women is exactly what they have. And you are the woman. How do you feel about yourself? Are you in because you're supposed to be in or are you in just because you want to fulfill the 30%? That's why you're in. So you feel so small about yourself, right? So you think the policy is good for you? You know, some women will say, come on, we don't need this sort of policy. If we are that good, you still need us, man. You know, there are people who think like that. Some people will say that this is more like a sympathy kind of thing that you try to pour out. So there's a lot of controversial debate, but these are examples of what you can do diversity policy, okay? Now, you, you can also try to change the way of your recruitment strategy. Consider recruitment strategy that will give you a bit of flavor of diversity. Like maybe you, you want to go into different job market, like where you want to hire your, your candidate. You see, like for example, if you advertise your advertisement in the star, you may get one type of crowd. But if you advertise in another place, you may get another type of crowd. You know, that kind of things that we are saying. Now, all these are things that the nomination committee is supposed to do. So I have uh, run through all that with you. Sorry, uh, we have not really like run through all the code because there's a lot of things I have to highlight here. Okay, uh, maybe you should take a break. Okay, take a short break. Okay. Now let's uh, continue to page 62. Uh, I would like to explain to you a few more issues then we moved on. Eh? Okay. Uh, we know about how nomination involve themselves in assessing board balance and we've looked at four types of balance and there's a, a few more things I need to highlight to you but before that let's just progress on with the code. Now if you see the second last paragraph it says over here the value of ensuring committee membership is refreshed and that undue reliance is not placed on a particular individual should be taken into account when you want to decide the chairman and the committee member. Now, what, what, what does it mean by the value of making sure that committee membership is refreshed? Okay, what, what, what is the meaning of refreshing the membership? What's the opposite of fresh? Spoil. Stale. Stale. Wow, very good. Huh? Normally, I ask what's the opposite of fresh. My name is not fresh. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we all got better vocab. Okay, uh, what happens when you're not fresh being an individual or being a human? Okay, you're boring. You're bored of something. You, you become dull. All right, you become dull. And what will happen to your role? 
yeah, you, you basically find that you are like losing that, that fire spark, you, you are not motivated. Uh, do you have example of people that they are dull with their role on their daily life? Huh? <laughs> are you like that? Quite like that. Is. Sometimes. Most, Most of the time. Actually, what caused it to be like that? Very routine, Okay, because you're doing the same thing again and again. Actually, I don't know whether you realize or not that your mom could be one of those that usually is quite to that point. Example, uh, but at least my mom sometimes appears to me like that. When it comes to deciding what to cook, she will like, don't know what to cook. Or, or ever your mom come and talk to you like, what do you want to eat? Nah? I cook until I don't know what to cook again. Or you tell your mom like, are you this again? Nah? <laughs> that way you so so your mother is at a typical example that her role is already bored and dull and ineffective nothing exciting anymore all right so if you want to make things better to improve it then you must consider what it says here refresh it how do you refresh it? Okay, change your mom. That's a good idea. <laughs> okay. All right. Go home and tell mom. You sack. All right. I, I mean, I mean, it's actually a, not not a bad thing. You can tell mom, mom, you don't cook for one month. Let that cook. All right. I mean, you you get different. Now, actually, 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 you've been doing that lah. Just that you don't realize only. Is when you tell your mom, I think today you don't cook, lah. we go out and eat. Yeah, all that. See, so the, actually what you're doing is you're changing her role. Right? You don't want her to cook because you're tired of her <laughs> cooking the thing. So you want other people to do it. Now, changing person is a way of refreshing. Uh, if you want the same person to, to do the work, but you want to improve his effectiveness through refreshing, what can you do? You just say what? You're, you're, you're dull of the job because it's routine, it's repetitive, it's again and again. So, one way is we give them new role or new skill. So, you, if, if you sign up your mom to learn some different way of uh, culinary art, I'm sure she's going to be more excited. Send her to learn some uh, Mongolian food and then learn some Brazilian food. Well, every day you come back, it's like a fancy restaurant to you, you know? okay? Uh, but pay money and train her. Uh, you know, invest in your mom. Now, so that's why they say you have to value this. To refresh the committee membership. Which include, like we say, change the member. Don't, don't let the same people do the same job again and again. Now, that's the reason why they say that. But uh, take into account when you want to decide who is the chairman who is the member, so that you might want to take into account whether rotation is needed or a new person is needed. Uh, the next one is basically very straightforward. Uh. They just say that no other person than the committee chairman and the member should be present at their own meeting. So technically, when the audit committee is calling for a meeting, only the audit committee member can be there. The rest of the people are not supposed to be there. Not the CEO, not the chairman of the, the board, not the rest of the people. But if you want, you can invite them to be there. But you have the exclusive right to, to meet on your own without their presence. Okay, okay. Uh, that's what we see regarding the principle. So let's look at the code provision now. Now, the, this part of the provision actually link back to chairman. If I, if I would just remind you when we did this last Thursday, page 61, if you look at A3.1, A3.1, uh, do you see what it says there? A3.1, the first line goes on and says that the chairman should on appointment meet the independence criteria set out in B1.1. Now, this is how we judge 
whether director is independent or not. And, and I also highlighted these things to you just now, that the role of the nomination will assess director's independence. So I, I put there, see or not, in asterisk, to assess independent, what's the criteria? And now the code is basically giving us a list of criteria. Now the code tells us over here, the board should identify in the annual report each NED that they consider as independent. So you, you can, you actually have to state in the annual report, if you find that the director is independent or not, okay? Now the board should determine whether director is independent in character or judgment and whether that relationship or circumstances which are likely to affect or could appear to affect the director's judgment. Now, I, I think you understand why they say could affect, likely to affect or could appear to affect because whenever we talk about independence, there are two degree of independence, right? One is called independence of. You know, you know, when we assess or measure the degree of independence, there's two ways we look at it. What is called independent of, likely to affect or could appear to affect. So they're, they're referring to what independent? Measuring your independence from perspective or what? Independence of mind and independence of appearance. Remember or not? Independence of appearance is how people see you. All right. Independence of mind is how yeah what you actually are. Can you know? One is how people see you. The other one is how you actually behave, which is inside you. Can you know? Now that's why we we say that independence of mind is important for what? Yeah, for the quality of the decision. The mind preserves the quality of decision, whereas the appearance is to what? Preserve the the mind is to preserve what? So the, the appearance is to preserve what? The mind is to preserve quality. The appearance is to preserve confidence. Whether people trust you or not is your appearance. Okay, can you say not? The trust comes from your appearance. But the quality come from your mind. Now we, we need both, lah, Okay, okay. Then it goes on and says that the board that the board should state the reason if it determines that a director is independent, notwithstanding existence of relationship or circumstances which may appear relevant to his determination. Including now, you, you read carefully, yeah. The court never say that this will not make you will, will make you not independent. They didn't say that. They say you should give reason to say that your director is still independent, even though when these circumstances are there. So they, they don't straight away qualify you. They give you a potential chance to explain that if you be, believe that they are still independent. The example they say. If that person has been an employee within the last five years. So what is the problem when you have been an ex-employee of the company? What what threat will you have as an director? Okay, you can have familiarity threat. Uh, besides familiarity threat. Yeah, you may have self-review thread as well because you, you may actually get involved with things that you've done. Okay, uh, if that person has or has had within the last three years a material business relationship with the company, either as a partner or as a shareholder, as a director, or as a senior employee. So why having material business relationship affects you? Self interest, okay? <laughs> Give me an example how how can this material business relationship affect the, the director? How do you use this to manipulate or control a person? Even <laughs> 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 
<laughs> you like me, I like you. you okay. Yeah, you, you, you don't do this, I don't give you this, alright? So what's this, this, that's, that's the one that we talk about this, okay? Now, you should, for example, if let's say you are you you are the, the one that supply things to my company, you are my supplier, okay? Now, then you do business with me. Okay, who decides whether or not I buy from you? Now, that, that's a very important thing to see whether you see the issue. Who decides that? Whether or not I buy from you? Yeah, usually it's procurement manager. If the size is more... Then maybe the director or the CFO or even the CEO. No, but, but do you really go all the way to the board director to approve supplier? It's very unlikely, right? Because that, that decision will not involve such a high level of authority. So which means the one that's in charge of giving you the business is from the management, the CEO. Now, if you come inside the board and sit as a non-executive director... Now, I am the CEO. Whenever there's any board resolution, I, I need people to support me, right? And what will happen if you don't support me? Like, what do you say? I'll just cancel the contract. Or, or you might be afraid of me cancelling the contract. So that might be a factor that will affect your objectivity. That you might just want to use that to, to keep on supporting me. Now, that's how you must explain. Huh? Okay, uh, has received or receive additional remuneration from the company apart from director fee. Now, what kind of remuneration? That will include example like bonus or share option or performance-related pay. Now, how does the performance-related pay be capable of influencing your independent? That it will affect the way you, you derive your judgment. How? Yeah, higher profit will result in higher pay, right? And, and in what way that you will be affected in the process of making the company having higher profit? So what, what you say is, right, the higher profit, the higher pay you're going to get because your pay now has performance related. So one way of making as well getting more is to make the company have higher profit. But in what way that you can make the company having higher profit? Who are you? To manipulate account. Ah. Support every decision that ED made. Ah, that sounds better. If you just say support everything ED made, I think that's a bit a, a bit hard to come to the point. Like your one is a bit too much. Right? Go and tell the auditor. Hello. Where well, we want to do all that, and, you know, even though we, we, we want to have the company make profit, doesn't mean we must stain our hair with such a dirt, right? Why we go and tell the auditor we don't have to do that one, okay? So, example of the simplest thing that I can do is very simple. The management has intention to overstate the profit. It's not that I want to help them to increase the profit. They, they have the intention. If they don't have intention, why am I so stupid to go and tell them, hey, you manipulate the profit? Lah. I mean, why do you do that? But now they have the intention. Okay, if you are the management side, what is the usual thing that you can use to manipulate profit? That doesn't seem to be so wrong. Yeah, provision, allowance. You, you know, these are the things that usually we play, play around with, like reduce allowances, impairment but don't write off, that kind of thing. Okay, now... Uh, bad debts, you know, usually this is the more likely reason why business is suffering. Man. Cannot get back money, man. You sell, 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 at the end the debtors cannot pay. So what are you going to do with this debt? A few hundred million, you write off. Lo. But I don't want to write off. But I write off, only my profit is affected. Uh, so I choose not to write off. Or don't recognize impairment. You, you know, usually these are all the things that you, you see it will affect. So... Even most companies now are affecting, affected by all these reasons. So if they want to play around with that, they would probably suggest that they do not want to recognize this kind of losses. Now, what's your stand if you are the audit committee? Which normally you should go in and say, no, law. you say, cannot, how can you do that? But because it affects your own personal gain, you are more likely to close one eye. Okay? So please explain properly, yeah. If you do need to explain, you must say all that, all right? If not, I cannot see why is this a problem, okay? Now, having close family relationship, 
that's quite obvious, right? You, you don't want to offend the relationship, so you protect the relationship. Now, it can be relationship with advisor, director, senior employee. Okay, I'm going to skip the next one. Significant shareholder is also a problem. What's wrong when you are a significant shareholder? You, you don't want the share price to drop. Okay, you, you, you might want the <laughs> share price to go up. Don't want the share price to drop. Yeah, what, what, one of the reasons could be because you want your own wealth to increase through the increase in the share price. Okay, fine. Now, uh, another problem with major shareholders is they may want to do something that benefit themselves. But as they benefit themselves, right, they also affect the minority. Like an example, uh, Genting recently said that, uh, okay, you know who is the, the owner of Genting? Lim Gotong died many years in there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lim Gotong's son, okay? Lim what? Lim what? Lim Kok Wing. Lim A. No, no, it's simply, okay, it's Lim Kok Te, okay? Lim Kok Te, all right? Now, he, he personally has an investment in Vegas. He, he had one that he bought, okay, in Las Vegas, that is in a terrible state, losing money, all right, and, and not doing well in the risk of bankrupt, all that kind of nonsense. So what happened was he sell that company to Genting. And Genting bought it at a much higher price. Now, what do you think? That's a good example of how it's so not fair, right? But you can't stop it up because he, he is the director. He has one of the major shareholders. He has the voting power. So the only people that will feel so unfair is the minority. That, 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 one, that one is not affecting at that level. It didn't cross the level that you, you need that kind of decision. It's still within the board kind of thing. All right? so, but this is so common. All right? And this is like so openly done. Everybody is like cursing, but what can you do? So you're not happy, sell the share? All right? uh, but this is a share, don't buy, la, not good. La. No moral. Okay? But Moral is very important. Don't invest in businesses that got no moral. Because I always believe God will not be blind. One day the business die. Man. You may not agree with me, right? Okay. Now, uh, serve on the board for more than nine years. Okay, what's wrong when we are directors serving more than nine years? Why would a long servicing director be not independent? Yeah, yeah, basically, you get to know them very well, okay? So the familiarity threat increases. Now, these are seven things. So I still have one more that I'm not explained to you, which is the third last from the bottom. Whole cross directorship. What's a cross directorship? Eh? Let me see. Okay, I just use the space here. Lah. Now, let's say we have A, PLC, B, PLC, two companies. Okay, we have two executive directors here. We have John and let's say Smith. So how do you have a cross directorship? So John cross over to B become NED. And Smith cross over to A become NED. So this become a situation of what? Why, why that Smith and John are not independent? How, how? How would their independence be jeopardized? Yeah, they support each other. Meaning they tell John, John Smith, tell John, you know, I'll support you in exchange of you support me in my board. So eventually, John and Smith control it. Now, please note that cross-directorship 
need not to be just two companies. I mean, you can cross in, in much more complicated way. Let's have one more CPLC, all right? And then let's have a David. So David, John, Smith. That's still cross, right? If you just look at A, A, and B, you probably will not see the cross. I mean, if you just focus at these two companies, you will say, okay, what? But if you focus at these two companies, you probably say, still okay, what? But when you start putting all the three companies together, hey, then again, you notice the problem that we said just now occur, right? How? John will tell me to help David so that David will help John. Fair enough? So it, it still come back. That's why in practice, how do you detect cross directorship? See, that's the reason why we need a control over everything. And, and the control is being created through the, the garment system. For example, according to the law, Whenever you want to set up a company, all these things must be registered with the government, right? That's why we have we have the SSM, we have the Securities Commission. Then you will have to, to submit in the name of the director. You cannot be a director of the company and then your name will not appear. Impossible. I can just do a very simple thing. I just go to CITOS and buy your information. Everything can come out. All right? You, you can buy any, any information. It's a, it's a public information that you can purchase. So I can just use your name, your IC, I just go there, register, I pay, I buy, 25 in here. Anyway. You can buy mine also if you want. But why, why you want this information? So usually we use this for internal control. For example, like before a bank give you a loan, they will check. You can do a secret check also what? with Bank Nagara. Secret. C C R I S Secris. CITOS is the private one. Bank Nagara has one called Secris system. You just go to Bank Nagara, use your IC, put in, and you can print the report. So you must learn how to manage your credit score. Because your credit score will affect the capability of you borrowing money in the future. Uh, so when you're young, you, you build this kind of thing. Because it takes time. Right? So when you start building credit score, then when you want to borrow money to take loan, uh, you find it easier to buy houses, for example. If not, you've got no credit score, uh, you want to buy houses, you, you are like a blank card. You, know? you don't have any record. So bank will say, well, no ex it's like hiring a no experienced person. Uh. But if you've got credit score, say, mm, okay, you, you have a very nice track record of showing how punctual you make payment and stuff. Uh, okay? Now, so understand that uh, this is what clear uh, cross-directorship means. Uh. So all that has the potential risk of affecting directors independent, okay? Okay, let's uh, move on to the next page, see what it says. Uh. Now, I've explained this part to you about the committee membership. Now, I've told you about the balance of skills experience, okay? Now, let's move on and see what it says. Uh. The non-executive directors should be appointed for a specified term. and subject to re-election, okay? Now, this thing will cross to B7. All right, it will refer, it will cross to B7 on re-election. Now, how long normally a director will be appointed to? How many years that we will appoint a director? One year. One year all right. Normally, it's one to three years. But in UK, right, the moment when the business is up to certain size, they only allow maximum one year. They, they never allow director to be appointed more than a year. Now, you think and see, if a minister is elected for 10 years. 
what will happen to your country? Gone, right? I mean, you just imagine if every time I can sit there and rule the government for 10 years, if, if I'm a hopeless guy, you also hopeless already because 10 years later, your country is gone. Now, so that's why the election in a country is usually four to five years. Like Malaysia, maximum is five years. So after five years, you have to step down. It's not, a, it's not a choice. You have to step down. You can call for an earlier election, but you have to step down after five years. Now, and of course, there's a reason why they... They do it every five years. Why not they do it earlier? Why not the law say every three years? Because the cost of having an election is very, very expensive. That's why if you do it too often, it actually becomes a burden to a country. So that, that's why to give and take, they find five years is just nice. Okay? Now, so we will see that the court suggested Director should be appointed between one to three years. We'll see this when I come to B7, and I'll tell you the reason why we wanted that, okay? Now, and uh, it goes on and says that if you have any term that is beyond six years for a non-executive director, that means the non-executive director is already there in the company, and he has been reappointed or re-elected again and again and again and again, again. Now, now it comes to a period more than six years. Do you still want him to continue or not? Now, that's a question. And they say that if you still think you want him to continue, then this is what you have to bear in mind. Have a rigorous review. That means you, you really assess him properly before you say you want to take him. And especially, when you want to do that, they say especially you must consider the need of progressive refreshing of the board. That means ask yourself, do you think it's time that you need fresh blood than to have the same people there? Because when you have the same people, you get the same old idea, the same thing repeating, you, you basically lost a lot of creativity, a lot of effectiveness. Okay? Okay, uh, basically then it goes on and says that in the annual report, right, you need to have a section that describes the work of this committee. So it's very normal. Okay, we just write down they are terms of reference, okay? So usually we call this the TOR, the terms of reference. Nowadays, the main practice they do is they put it up in the website. So if you go to most of the listed company, I, I think basically I would say all of the listed company, you can see in the left website, they will have a TOR for all the committee. And what does the TOR uh, uh, function as? The purpose of the TOR is to write down expressly their purpose, their authority, their role. So that, that's why we need a TOR. The purpose, the authority, and their role. Okay? Now, which is a very important thing because when you really have any kind of fight, boardroom fight, then the TOR is usually referred to and see whether you have certain power. All right, you look at like last election or last two elections, we had a lot of problem because of the close fight between the ruling government and the opposition. Then they start to look into the power of the Sultan. That's why all the while people always say Sultan na ah, agong all useless one. But suddenly they feel like wow, now only they know Sultan can be so powerful because of all these problems that they face. That's, that's the same kind of situation we're trying to say. Like what role and what power do you have? So if you talk about issue concerning director's remuneration, so who has the right to make a say and make a stand? Because that person who make a stand has the call. Now that, all that is very important. Okay. Okay, so th this concerns with nomination issue. So we're talking about nomination committee. We're talking about board balance. Now, we still continue. It's still nomination. I've not finished. Now, now they look at the other part of nomination issue. So they say that uh, make sure directors have sufficient time. So don't get directors that they got no time to, to spend. Okay, then they say when you do appointment of chairman, you should prepare a job specification. Now, we have explained all that already, right? So this is done. Now, it also go on and says that whatever commitment, time commitment of chairman must be disclosed. 
So you must let them know that this is how much time you can offer. Then uh, B3.2 go on and says that the, the terms and condition of the appointment of NED must also be available. And again, you must look at the time commitment. So it's more or less the same thing because it's talking about do you have time for the company or not. So they're looking at time, okay? Now, then it moved on and say you should not agree to a full-time executive directors, okay, to take on more than one non-executive directorship in FTSE 100. What is this? Uh? This is basically the way how they rank the size of a listed company in UK. So that's the ranking. Okay, in UK, right, if you fall outside FTSE 350, you'll be considered as the small PLC. Okay? Alright, so if you fall outside this, alright, then you are considered small. What is FTSE 350? That means you are the the 350 largest company, all right, 350 largest company in the stock exchange. Like in Malaysia, our stock index, uh, do you know every day they talk about stock index, the point go up, go down, go up, go down. What index, which company that they measure? What is the name of our index? KLCI, which stands for? Kuala Lumpur. What's the I? Index, uh, what's the C? Composite. Composite means a mix. A mix of how many companies? 30. That's why if government wants this index to go up, right, they just need to buy the share of the 30 company enough of it. You can have the whole Malaysia, all company going down, but the 30 company go up, the point is still up. Uh, and then they have this thing called window dressing. Window dressing is because the funds, they want to look good on paper, right? So when it comes to the window dressing period, the day before they close, uh, they go and buy up the share so the price go up. So that on paper, on year end, for example, it looks good. Okay, but, but it's not so simple now because nowadays window dressing is not on a specific day. Last time people were a bit stupid, la. the government was so stupid. So they always say window dressing is the last day of the reporting period. So at last day is Friday. The Friday, let's say, is on the 28th of February. Eh? So all the, the public, they're very smart. They know that day is window dressing day. So they know mati mati, eh, all the big funds will come and buy up the price. Eh? So what they do eh, on the 26th, 25th, eh, they buy this. Then on the 28th, they purposely put there to sell and let the fund buy. So eventually, they, they cheated that kind of profit. But now, it cannot be. Because now, window dressing no longer fall on a specific day. So it's up to them to decide when they want to report the year end. Okay, Okay. Uh, so this is the main thing that we see about nomination. Okay, before I, I move on to the next part, let's just come back to this. Uh. I've told you about the four types of balances that the nomination committee takes care. Now, and I also highlighted to you, so I'm going to use this to explain. Uh. I also highlighted to you that we have to consider how memberships are refreshed. Okay? We have to consider how membership are refreshed. Now, we also ask to consider the size of the board so that we should minimize disruption. Okay, sorry, the way is disruption. All right, you should consider the size of the board to minimize disruption whenever there are change of member. Okay, whenever there are change of member. Now, so all that will call us into one more area which is succession planning. Okay, succession planning.
Now, what is the, the whole idea behind succession planning? You know, they always say that there is a lifespan to our life. Because, you know, like after maybe you reach 70, 80, we die. But what is the lifespan of the company, theoretically? It should be indefinite. Because technically, companies should not have a lifespan. As long as you continue to grow, as long as you continue to stay relevant, as long as you've got good people to run the business, your, your company can go on for years. So do we have companies that is of hundreds of years? Got one. Yeah, we, we have lots of companies that's like, until now, it's still going strong, right? Now, what is the main um, feature that distinguish companies that survive long and those companies that after a while, they start going signs of decline? Suc succession planning, okay? Which is a very important element to determine how long can you go on. What is one weakness in succession planning that we see? Yeah, they always want their own family people to take over. That's why the father must, must leave behind for the son. And then the son didn't do a good job. Then some people say there's this Chinese belief, there's this curse of three generations. Yeah, they say that uh, wealth can never pass beyond three generations. The first generation will build, second generation will sustain, third generation will destroy it. So that's the curse of three generations. All right. Now, uh, of course, uh, I, I don't believe in all that. I just believe in management. If you manage all these things well, there shouldn't be a problem. Now, so if your job is nomination committee, okay, how do you see yourself playing a role for succession planning as a nomination committee? How, how do you see yourself to play a role behind succession planning? So when, when you see succession planning, what position that you look at that is considered important? Only CEO, right? No, it's actually all position. You, you, you know, succession planning is not just about one position that you need to fill. It's actually all the position that you have to fill it. So that's why it must be organization-wide that everything has to be filled in whenever there is a need. Now, how do you assess whether a company has succession crisis or not? Yeah, but, but how do you spot the risk of succession crisis? That means if you look at this company, wow, this company is very high risk. Huh? A lot of what? A lot of people don't want to join the company. Sucks. A lot of family members in the board. A lot of family members in the board. Okay. Now, usually you have a crisis in succession is because somebody leaves and then no one, no one fill in, right? Now, do you think it's best to get a successor from outside or inside? Depends. Depends. Uh. What do you think is better? Now, what, what's the risk of getting successor from outside? Changing of culture. It, it's definitely going to come in and, and show you that it's a completely di different thing because I'm a new person, okay? Now, so if you really want to retain the culture of an organization, and, and culture is the reason why you may stay long, because of the value that you have, because of the belief that you have, that's why you're still there, you're still relevant. So if people just come in and change your culture, you're gone, man. And the problem is you don't have people inside that's ready to take up. So one way for us to know whether there is a, a succession risk or crisis in a company is you look at the demographics. You just take all the staff of your company, each group, and you analyze the graph. Then you see how does the graph looks like. So, and then you look at the level of management, like at operational level, tactical level, strategic level, and again, you analyze according to the age group. So, if you start to see the age group has a huge gap, for example, uh, uh, very old people at strategic level, a lot of young people at tactical level, I mean at operational level, then you have a missing gap in the tactical level. That means the center got no people. 
So if people up there start dying, how, how are you going to feed? This is like what? This is like a family. The parents are both 50 to 60 years old, but the children is now 4 to 5 years old. You see the problem? Now, if you have a family like you are 50, 60, your children is around 30, and then you have another generation at the bottom, you find that you are more better off. Now, you see one problem that people say, uh, I, I don't know whether you, you, you always hear this or not. People always tell you that it's so expensive to have children now. That's why they choose not to have a lot of children. Am I right? Yes. People say two enough, la, one enough. La, correct, no? Do you know how difficult it will be for that one? It will be easy for you. But you're so selfish for that son or that daughter of yours because you're going to create such a big problem for her. Because why? No succession planning. Where is that person going to get support in the future? Because whatever your parent plan is from the siblings they have. The side, the to me, is the economic power always come from resources. Right? If you've got 10 people working in a family and 2 people working in a family, which family will have better economic power? 10, no? And somehow you say you want to cut down because the cost is high. So at the end of the day, in the future, that's my way of seeing things. Like, I don't know whether you agree or not. Like, okay? But this is how I look at it. So from macro side, the country will be in crisis when you don't have enough population. Because nothing can drive it. You see, you know? So you need the people to come in. Now this is ex exactly what you need to do. So it's only the scale that you see in it. So you look at organization. If the people are all in this zone or in this level, uh, you're going to have a crisis. So you must plan. And one way of planning is how you want to create progression. That's why one of the best industries, if you ask me, that has very good succession planning uh, is audit firm. Because audit firm has a very good structure that will tell you after one year, this is where you are. After another year, this is where you are. So they seem to give people a very clear picture of how you move. And then they can go on with that. That's why they survive very long. Okay. Now, back to this. Uh. So if your, your task as a nomination committee is to take care of succession planning, then you have to ensure that there are actions in place for a smooth succession, which may include a lot of things. Example, how do you predict your succession needs? You know, a lot of people will say that I don't need a successor now because it's not the time there, which I think it makes some sense. Like, it's like, for example, I don't think I have an urgency to write a will if now I'm only 40. Now, it's not to say that it's not a good thing, but I, I, I may still procrastinate and feel like I, I'm just 40, unless I really got a sudden death. Like. But for a man that is 65 or 70, I think that is more urgent. So it's the kind of thing that we see. So sometimes companies say that, okay, well, my CEO is still young. Man. But if your CEO is quite old, then people will start to say, maybe you should start thinking of who will succeed him. Now, so you must look at your succession needs. Now, you have to look at your progression pathway. It's how a staff can move up. Do, do you even have a pathway? It's very critical. Okay? Now, you may even need to take into account some kind of succession policy. Uh, I give you an example of things that people do in practice and you might feel a bit funny. For example, there are some organizations never allow their senior management to take the same public transport. Like you cannot take the same flight. If the CEO takes flight in the morning, the CFO takes the night flight. Because in case if two, I mean not two, if the airplane crash, one die enough, like, don't die two. All right. I remember. I remember this during my young time. Uh, the mother very cute one. So I used to work 
part time in the bookstore with my auntie la. So my auntie got to send all of us to to all the bookshop and help ma. So the mother always tell my auntie ah, you carry my son, and your assistant carry another son. So then only I realized that hmm okay okay so so that's why when you mingle with different people your experience so so young I learned about succession planning. So the auntie always joke one so that if I got accident, at least one son died. Don't two sons die together. Wow, well, the mother very objective. Uh, okay, then, uh, okay? But, but this is example of policy. There, there are a lot of organizations, they have security policy that will protect the life of important personnel. You look at, you look at for example, uh, uh, US, in terms of their president, you look at the aeroplane Air Force One, it's a very expensive aeroplane just to ensure that if, if the president is up there in the plane, you cannot go and kill him by bomb the plane because the plane comes with a lot of very, very high-tech security features. Right? That's why the plane is so expensive. I, last time I read this, don't know, four or five billion, you know, for one plane to carry one guy. And it's not that he is important. You know, if he dies, it's not a big issue. Obama dies now, who cares? If Obama dies, nobody cares. Who cares about Bush dying or not? Nobody cares. People only care if the president dies. Not Donald Trump, not Obama. It's the president that they care. So the position is important. Now, all that is part and parcel of your job to think of succession planning. Now, I have some notes at the back uh, which cover a bit to do with succession issue. Uh, you can read yourself, like, page 87. Okay, so I, I don't intend to run through all that because it's like not very critical, so I'm just going to stop that. Okay, uh, that's to do with V3. Okay, I'm done with issues concerning nomination. Okay, let, let's go on and discuss something here. Okay, you have just been informed that you will, you will you'll be offered the position as NED. Okay? Now, you are given NED position. Now, and assuming that this position will also include that you will be appointed inside audit committee. So, you will also be in the audit com. Now, I, I need you to see the important, to really understand why we need to have all these things. Okay? Now, so let's say uh, the, the next board meeting or committee meeting will be somewhere around 27th of April 2020. Today is 22nd of February 2020. Okay. So what do you expect when you are now appointed as NED? Now, let me tell you officially your job as a director is to avail yourself on the 27th to attend the meeting. Okay? Now, so what happened is on that 27th, you must attend meeting. So you arrive when the meeting is about to start and sit there all the way until the end of the day. And you are done. You can go home. Okay? So that's why, as I say, if you really just go there and sit and don't do anything, all right, it's fine. Your job is done. Because they just need to have enough number of directors and they just need people to be there to vote and to sign documents. And you are just one of them. Okay? So if you really got appointed and really on the 27th of April, 
you attend the meeting as a fresh sheet. I'm using this as a real thing for you, okay? Now, let, let's say what happened is, along this period, nothing happened. So, somewhere around maybe one week before the meeting, you receive an email. And the, the email, all right, has all the notices and let's say all the draft reports, okay? All the draft reports. My question is this. Let's say I, I, I just simply go to internet just now and happen to simply download one of the report of one of the listed company in Malaysia. I, I just simply take, so please don't ask me why this, I don't know, okay, simply take. Now, uh, I realize from the annual report, this company has existed in many countries. For example, I noticed that they have a subsidiary in USA, they have a subsidiary in Sri Lanka, they have Indonesia, Cambodia, then they will even have uh, UK, India, and of course in Malaysia there's quite a lot, all right? So these are all the subsidiaries they have. Now, so if you receive the email, one of the drafts that you probably will receive is their financial result. Let's say this is a draft. The only difference, a draft and official, is official means they have published it. And most of the time, the draft has not much of changes, man. Because usually we are, we are okay with it, then we just accept it. Now, what can you do if you just get an email with this report that you see, okay, that uh, there's an income statement. Alright, you notice, you see an income statement. You look at a lot of figures. Revenue, they say, mm, okay, this year, mm, this quarter got profit, 9 million, okay? Then the net profit, 6 million. Then you look further, you find that uh, they also give you the balance sheet. Then you start to see the balance sheet. Okay, this is your current asset, non-current asset. Now, then you go down, you notice that the, the cash flow statement is given there. Now, you run through all the figures. Now, my, my question is, from running through figures like that, what can you see of this company? What will you understand of this company? And what would you want to ask? Just for example, just, just look at the PL. Okay, I'll show you the PL again. Alright, that's the PL. Okay. Uh, is the operating profit normal or abnormal? Is the revenue 48 million normal or abnormal? Do you expect the value to go up or go down? you actually don't know anything. You just know the figure is there. Because, you know, now if, even if I, if I give you an example, like let's say we go to the segmental result, uh, because usually the, the P&L is all consolidated. You probably find it a bit hard to see. Okay, let's just go to a segmental result. Okay, uh, we realize that they have segmented it according to geographical location. And then they also segment according to their business industry. So geographical location, you notice that uh, Malaysia seems to be the main segment, followed by Philippines, China. Okay? Then uh, they actually have four categories, actually three, la, outsourcing, education, consolidated is combined. So actually only two only, outsourcing, education. The education is so small, I don't know what is that. Alright, so outsourcing seems to be the main thing. What kind of service do they outsource? Can you tell from this? How many services they offer? Which service that they are doing well? Which service that they depend more? You, you don't see anything at all, right? Okay, when you don't see anything at all, because whatever you see now is as though an investor is from outside looking at the figure, you, you can't tell much from the figure. Okay, then my next question is, on that day, what are you going to do? You, you come at it, the meeting, you're right. Wow, your first day, very excited. You hold her back, you, you reach out, the board meeting, all the director there, you sit down. Okay, what are you going to do? Just listen. Just listen. Uh. 
Okay, after you listen, huh, you go back. Okay, you go back. When's the next time you're going to come again? It's three months later. Then another three months later. Then another three months later. Now, even when you just go there, assuming you go there lah, first time, huh, who are the people you know? Possibly you don't know most of them. Then after that day finish, you just shake hand and say goodbye. You probably know their name. The next three months later you come back, who are the people you know? It's like, I only met you once every three months, you know. So do you see the problem now? The problem is as an NED, you have this handicap that because you are not in the business. You see, if you are ED, I don't have an issue one because ED will be there every day. Because every day you're in the office, you were bound to know the people. Because every day you're here, you're bound to understand the business. Because you're exposed to it. But NED got a problem. You don't even know where are their business. You won't even go to their places. You think you're going to go to all the country and take a tour. You won't one. Now, when you have such lack of understanding, what do we expect from NED? Nothing. If you can't contribute, how to protect investor? Cannot. So, so the, the handicap is the big problem that we are having. Now, that is the reason why they say when all director join the board, you must get an induction. Okay? When all directors join the board, you must get an induction, especially NED. Because NED will not have so much opportunity to expose themselves. They, they are not there every day. Man. Okay? So it's even harder for you to even pick up things. Understand or not? Because of your exposure is so minimal. Now, so you must get an induction. So what is induction then? From your own understanding based on the problem that I just explained to you, what is then an induction? What's that? Yeah, an introduction. You know, when every student join a new university or college, they usually get what? <laughs> yeah, they get, an or they get an orientation with an orientation camp, okay? What is the purpose of the camp? Huh? To know each other some more? Camp or do they introduce the college in the camp? Oh, but ours is more to instill you our culture. We, we want the culture. That's why we send you to the camp to let you know that's how we behave, right? Okay. Now, so induction is a familiarization program. Okay, it's a familiarization program. It's like what you call orientation. It's a way of how you introduce this company to this new director. You intend to use the shortest time to give this person the longest experience possible. You know, it's like I'm going to tell you that after this induction or orientation program, you will feel like as though you have worked here for about a few months or, or one year. That you, you really know us. Can you see or not? Now, that, that's the induction program. It's to speed up the process that you can contribute as a director. Okay, so if, if you know that is what we're going to do, so tell me, what will you do in the induction program? Now, you're going to design an induction program for a new director. What would you want to do for this new director? Send him to an orientation camp? <laughs> what will you do for this new director? Okay, tour. Tour all the places. Perhaps you tell them, okay, uh, we have a few offices, and now I will bring you to see all these places. At least you, you can just take a look. That's how we look like. I, I think, is that important? Why? Yeah, to rough idea what business you're doing, right? You, you, you know, for example, if you're talking about manufacturing, 
I'm discussing about losses in the production process. You have not even seen the factory. How can you even understand what we are saying? The director are talking about losses, how the losses was going out of control, this thing is reject, that thing is reject, then you sit there. <laughs> then your head say, losses, losses. Okay, I don't know what is that. All right, okay, just smile. <laughs> All right? So that, how, how are you going to serve? That, that's the problem. And it won't solve the problem after three months. One. You think after three months, what? Your knowledge will suddenly come into your brain. Uh? There's a chip for you to download the information. They just plug into all going. It won't be. It will still be the same. That's why it will not solve the problem until you're officially given this stage of process to introduce you to familiarize with the business. Okay, so you decided to do a plan tour. And through the plan tour, you will introduce to the new director, example, the business, only business, the people, all right? Okay, what, what other things that you might want to do with this new guy? Okay, you want to explain the product, all right? Faster, faster. Time's up. What else do you want him to know? The history of the company. Alright. Some more? Okay, the vision and mission. What else? Faster, are you so simple? What are their assets? Who are the key competitors? What are the main risks of the business? Who are the key staff they depend on? What are the policies of the business? All oh, this is not important. Ah. So you can tell. Ah. Why well, take so long? Can you see or not? So, so, so whatever that I've said to you, if you summarize it, right, it's all information about the entity. So you're trying to give him all information about the entity, including their control system, their reporting system, all that. Now, so we actually can divide it into three aspects about the entity, about the people. Yeah, people. Okay, people, people. Why people, people? So if I'm going to divide people, people into two, what is the logical classification that I will divide? Yeah, see, you're so smart, right? People inside and outside of the company. People inside will be usually who? The staff, so staff means all of you. What kind of staff? <laughs> what, what's the difference between staff and employee? <laughs> Okay, that you probably might want to get him to know people at different level. Now, depending on what kind of director position that you're holding, uh, because there are certain stuff that are more important to you. For example, if I'm audit committee, I, I don't think production staff is so relevant to me. But account staff might be more relevant. Now, then you might know that directors could be more important, senior managers. So, low-level one may not be so important. So, it, it, it all depends on what position you're appointed to. What about people outside? Suppliers, customers, competitors, okay, funny, eh? competitor, go bring your competitor. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> okay, now you should competitor no la. How, how to how to go ahead and meet your competitor? Okay, your bank. Alright, you still have not said one very important one. The creditors, okay, still got one very important one. Shareholder. Ayo, your owner, Sandri owner never bring I How long like that? The owner be so sad, man. I'm, I'm the owner and you never bring the director to me. Now, think and see. If the director is ED or NED, right? The stakeholders that you introduce him to is quite different. For example, why on earth you go and bring NED to see customer? I, I, I don't think that is it, it, it's relevant. Because the non-executive director don't have to know the operational stuff. I won't be dealing in business, so I don't need to know your customer. So if you really ask me, the more important people the NED should see is who? 
shareholder. Because their job is to defend the shareholders, right? So they should talk to the shareholder. But if you are ED, uh, then you probably need to know. For example, if you are in the finance role, bankers are important. Uh, supplier might be important. Because, you know, so you, you then arrange different people to meet with them. Now, this is your job. Before a new director will actually start the work, you must have an induction. So imagine there will be an induction. No, no, I'm not going to write, okay? There will be an induction. So induction can be a series of things that happen. Maybe I will arrange for a visit this day. Then one day you come for product briefing. So during the briefing, I can have somebody to explain to you the company structure. All right? Then I can talk to you about product. I can give you a test or so. I mean, why not? See whether the director understand or not. Do an assessment. Okay, after I explain, after that, got 30 minutes test, MCQ. You must get 80 marks. If not, you fail. Then we'll do again. All right? It's any way you like, as long as the person start to develop understanding of the business. Now, that is what you do. Now, see, uh, right after the induction, the difference now is when this director example received the email, do you think he has a better understanding of the figure? He will probably say, hmm, now, now when I look at all the country, uh, I know what operation we do. I, I know why this country this year result is going to be better. Now, I also understand that this is all the expectation. This is what shareholder wants from me. So I, I can look at the number. I can make sense and imagine. Then I will be able to go to the board meeting and I can start to ask questions. I say, okay, can, can I know why that the result is like that? For example, I look at cash flow. You see, every time if you want to, that, that, that's my style. Like. I, I don't know how you agree with that. Now, I always love to analyze company from cash flow statement. I don't like to see P&L and balance sheet because P&L balance sheet is usually the result of what you have done for some time ago. Now, I always like to see what you do for the future. So cash flow statement is more meaningful to me. So every time when I see, I look at cash flow statement because there's where actual money coming in and out. So why do you use money to do all these things? I see, for example, acquisition of asset or disposal of machine. Then I ask them, what machine do you sell? Which business unit? Why do you sell it? What is the impact after you sell? So, so again, this is example of what I'll do in my experience to share it with you. Now, different people may have different style. But that's how you want to do it, okay? Now, so this is what it says about induction. Clear? Okay. It's not just induction. It says that they should regularly update and refresh their skill. Now, th this is development. Professional development, which I think you should know why they want you to do that. Now, the supporting principle, just go on and repeat the same thing and say that chairman must ensure directors continually update their skill. Then they must provide necessary resources. Now, uh, what do you understand from this statement? Companies should provide the necessary resources for developing and updating the director's knowledge. Well, it's very straightforward, right? What does it mean? means you must have the budget. Lah. If director needs to go training, let, let's say I'm nomination committee, okay? Now, I see that there is a need for director. You, you know, there's this type of master's program. Uh, and I mean, not master's program. They call it executive program. Uh. Uh, even Unisys, I have it. They have this type of short executive program that are meant for senior position, uh, like CEO, CFO, to attend in very short period, like two weeks. You fly all the way there, take one week, two weeks, attend that really condensed one and open up to a lot of view, a lot of discussion, a lot of content, then you come back. But it's not cheap, you know. But that's how people at that level can learn. Now, I can suggest that to a director. But question is, do you want to pay? Or not? The company may just say, wow, no way, man. Why, why should I pay for all these things? for?" So you may not want to invest, but... The code actually said company should provide resources. So basically, resources here means money. The money has to be there. Okay. Okay. Uh, looking at the provision of the code, uh, 
uh, it says that chairman should make sure directors receive the induction. So chairman is the one that is expected to do that. Chairman, make sure that the new director receive induction. Now, induction is full, formal, and even tailored. Meaning you expect different directors' induction program can be very different because of their background, their understanding, their level of knowledge, so you must adjust it. Now, and it goes on to another part and say that directors should avail themselves opportunities to meet shareholders. You have to allocate time. You can tell shareholder that I'm, I'm a new director, so uh, if they want to meet up, maybe we can meet over a luncheon next Wednesday. Now then you, you can call all your major shareholders and say, do you want to meet this director or not? Now shareholder may say, not necessary. If they say so, then let it be. But shareholder may want to meet. But question is, you offer yourself to meet the shareholder. Okay. Now, chairman also is the one that look at the training needs. So that's the development. Okay. Now we are moving on, finishing soon. Okay, this part of the code is finished. Okay, we go on until 7. Who, who is on? Ha, ha, ha. I prove to you. Oh. Huh? I give you a discount code for dinner on Food Panda. 30% discount. <laughs> Called Panda Paul. Huh? Can. Order. Okay. Now, uh, this is the section that basically says that director must get information in the form and of a quality that allow them to do their job. Now, basically, you know, you, you cannot work without information. We discussed this when we talked about the role of the chairman last, last Thursday, correct not? One of the role of the chairman is what? How many role of chairman I've told you? Six. Okay, if you can say all the six, then we'll finish punctually. Number one? Leadership. Hey, look at the notes, cannot. Uh. Leadership, then? Uh, look at the notes, okay? <laughs> now, so the, the part to do with accurate, clear, and timely information. Now, again, they remind that directors must be given accurate, timely, and clear information. And again, they re relate back to chairman. So it's actually the same thing. Uh. They overlap with it. Okay? Now, they say management has obligation to provide information, but director should seek clarification. So they, they are basically telling you director must ask questions. Uh. You know, anything you're not clear, you got to ask. Okay? Okay. Something that is uh, a bit different here is, they say, the ComSec is the one that support the chairman for a good information flow. Uh, what exactly is a good information flow? It's about the clarity of how information being communicated. Now, example, uh, uh, sending email. Okay? Now, if you send email to all the directors, do you think that's good enough? Before the, the board meeting, information sent by email. Do you think it's good enough? Perhaps, right? But do you think it's better if after send email, then the ComSec actually WhatsApp the director and confirm? Do you get my email? I see that. that. That's an example of good information flow. The practice of making sure that directors are informed, directors are aware. Can you see it Now, it's up to you how you want to do it. You can set up a simple WhatsApp group. You can use IT, like, like information management system. You know, those are workspace, uh, uh, teams, that kind of thing that all directors can be in. It's up to you. But it's your job to ensure the flow is there. Okay, that, that's what it says. Now, and your job as a secretary is to advise the board. 
Okay, so the whole idea of advising the board is about telling them issues on compliance. Uh. Example, uh, compliance matters. Okay, can we go to the next page and look at the provision? Now, this is a very important provision. Uh. It says that the non-executive directors especially must have access to independent professional advice at company's expense. I, I told this to you the last Thursday. Remember I said if I need to hire a consultant, do I have to go through the CEO? I don't need. I, I can just go ahead and take in a consultant because the code says so. The company should provide power to NED to access independent advice, that means people from outside, and it's at company's expense. That means company must pay, okay? Now, then they also say that directors should have access to the advice and services of the ComSec. It's not a very technical thing that we say here. It's something very simple, yet it's very important. Now, to, to, let, to let you appreciate what, I, what, what you see here is, let me ask you, if you want to speak to the Prime Minister today, now, do you have the chance? You don't have access? Huh? Okay, if you say via WhatsApp, do you have his phone number? Or oh, via viral, okay? So what, what I'm saying is the, the access is that. Do you have a way of reaching? Now, you, you say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I know he's this, this, this person. That means you have not directly to him. You probably got to go through a person, that, that person, go to another person, go to another person. It may not reach him. Uh, unlike I can tell you, I got his private phone number. I WhatsApp straight to his handphone one. So I got access. Oh? Now that's an example of access. So do you have access? Now for example, if you are staff in this college, if you have some issue about the running of the college, and then because Methodist College, we, uh, we have actually we practice a two-tier board here. We have a management board, then we have the, the upper board. The upper board are made up of all the board of directors and all the board of governors is from different representatives of the church. Huh? Okay. Now, my question is, let's say if you have an issue about the running of the college, you want to go up to the upper board as a whistleblower. Let's say, can any one of us do that? Then you've got to ask yourself, how are you going to do that? Do you know the people? Do you have access? Now, this is how important it is. So now question is, directors must have access to people that can help them. And one important people that help them is the ComSec. You must have access. It can be as simple as I have your WhatsApp number. I can WhatsApp you and ask you. And when I ask you, right, it's important that the ComSec will say, okay, what can I do for you? If the ComSec tell you, sorry, I can't do anything until I get the permission of the CEO, then gone. That means you don't have access. So that's access, okay? Now, we are ending. B6 is basically talking about how we should evaluate performance. Now, you see, we look through the whole logical sequence of governance. We started with discussing the head. We talked about how we must have a CEO and a chairman. Then we concentrate on the chairman talking about how we must have an ED. Then we go on and talk about how we must have a role of nomination to bring in the right people. Then we move on and look at how these people must go through induction and training. How they must get information. See, do you see the logical process that we are telling you now? We are preparing all the, the, the groundwork. Now the director can do their job. Okay, end of the day. How do you know directors are really good or not good? You evaluate them. That's why you see we are coming to the end of the cycle. So now they tell you, evaluate the director. Now, you are asked to do a formal... What is the formal evaluation? Formal means it's official. Like you go through a formal evaluation through what? As a student, what's your formal evaluation? Exam? It's a formal evaluation. Exam. That's why the exam decides you pass or you fail. That's a formal evaluation. Can you say or not? 
Now, if it can be informal, if let's say, for example, I just sit down with you, chit chat with you, okay, done. That, that means you don't even know why is it done, how is it done, when is it done. Now, that, that should not be the way. It must be formal. Now, not only formal, it must be rigorous, strict. And you're told that we need to evaluate your own performance, committee's performance, and the individual's performance. Now, own here refers to who is the own? Who is this document talking to? Document is talking to the board. So you are supposed to evaluate your own, I mean the board's performance, and the individual committee and the individual director. Now, they say chairman should act on the results of this evaluation, recognizing strength and weaknesses. How do you act on the result? Just give me an example. If the evaluation turns out to be directors are not doing very well, what do you do? Directors are not doing very well. Now, they say propose director to resign. Just, just tell them to step down. Okay? Uh, you know our Minister of Education? Masli, Masli. What happened? He resigned, right? But he don't want to make himself look so bad. That's why he also say, actually, I resign, but I don't want to resign, but I'm told to resign, so I resign. So you thinking like, so you resign or you not resign or what? So actually, he tried to make it as though he has been forced to resign. So if not, he won't resign. Right? But but why why it happened? Now maybe to certain people they felt that you are not that good, okay? So they don't want you to carry on, and it's not so nice to sack you. So usually they say, why not you resign? Like, it looks good on you. So, so that's an example of what chairman can do. Tell a director to resign. Okay. Now, you, you can also address their strength. You can consider give them reward, which go through the remuneration. Directors may get bonus. You may reappoint the director because they are good. Now, the individual evaluation must aim to assess whether the directors can contribute effectively and also demonstrate commitment to the role. Okay. The court only says this. The court says the board should state how performance evaluation has been conducted. The court did not ask you to disclose the result of the evaluation. Read, read again. State how your performance evaluation is being conducted. Okay. Suggest to me, if you want to evaluate performance of director, how would you do that? Give me a process of how the evaluation can be carried out. Mm. Okay, so go through the go through the minutes to see, but you don't have to do that. Right? You're already in a meeting, you should know, right? I mean, I don't have to analyze the minutes to see what you're, because I'm the lecturer, I can know how, who are active, more or less I know. The chairman will know. But you have to ask around, so under... But you can see yourself, man. I'm the chairman, I can know. it. Okay, but okay, look at the contribution. Yeah, what one of those non... Uh, uh, a bit like the, the soft factors is whether can you contribute, do you speak well, that kind of thing. Okay, but, but what system? Now, you, you are using a peer evaluation, okay? Like having a peer evaluation, which means like a director evaluate another director. Which is the way we've been saying, of like how the SID... NED group together to evaluate another chairman. Uh, that, that's like a peer evaluation. Other forms of evaluation? Huh? Results based. Okay, so that means you are looking at KPIs. Uh, uh, whether you achieve your key performance indicators, which, which might be more relevant to the ED. Okay, might be more relevant to ED. So meaning you must have set goals.
goals, set objective, then you measure the results, see whether you achieve it or not. Now we can do self evaluation also. Okay, I give an example. Uh. Uh, to let you guys know how well you behave or perform as a student, I give you a checklist. I say, go home, just be honest to yourself. Question one. Every time one day before class, I will go through what I studied last class. Yes or no? Okay. Uh, at the end of the class, I will go back and review what I've just studied. Yes or no? All right. I will do uh, past year questions on the on the topic that I've just taught. Yes or no? You, you know, I can ask all these questions, and if all the answer is no, 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 you know, no. All right. That, that, that means you ah uh, wow. You I feel so bad, man. Everything I say no. So that that's an example of how self evaluation can be. So you can be more reflective statement. All right, more reflective to see what 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 have you been doing as part of your role as a director or as a committee, whether you fulfill the criteria or not. Now, so most of the time, uh, whatever way we do, we will get directors to evaluate. Then the results might be compiled by the comsec. And then you might have to go through a, a meeting to discuss about it. I mean, if, if at the end of the day, you just evaluate for the sake of evaluating is useless. So you should meet and talk about, okay, now we realize that these are our problem. What can we do to overcome? Uh, can we strengthen ourselves through doing things differently? So all, all these are examples of things you must see. Now, there is actually a special requirement that if you are FTSE 350, that means you're big. Lah, huh? They say you must have external facilitator. So they actually put a requirement that performance evaluation should be externally facilitated. Why? Eh? It's like making sure that you're more serious. Lah. You, you know, if you only have your own evaluation, at the end of the day, you may just do it for the sake of doing. You know, a lot of people just, ah, okay, okay, answer, ta, 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 ta. At, the, at the end, it just put aside. But when you have external facilitation, you tend to be more serious. Lah. That, that's the whole thing we're trying to say. Tend to be more serious. And it will also give more confidence to your shareholder that you're doing it properly. Okay? Now, so that we, we have the assurance that you only keep directors that they're doing well. Okay. This is the last part. Re-election. What's the time now? I asked you earlier. Seven months. Okay. Uh, we talked about re-election earlier that directors should be re-elected regularly. Now, the court put on a requirement FTSE should get annual election. That means it's every year. So from here, we understand the term is one year. Okay, the term is one year. Now, all other director means if you are below FTSE 350, your election is made at the first AGM and then interval of no more than three years. So, those smaller one can be three years. That's why I told you it's one to three years. Now, and then it goes on and says that NED that served more than nine years was subject to annual re-election. Okay, whatever you see here, this is a concept, a practice that director will be elected for a specified term. And then at the end of the term, the director will retire. You retire. You step down. Okay? You retire. And then, 
subject to re appointment. Now, what is the rationale of using this system? One, we want to motivate the director. You know, they always joke one, uh, all these ministers, uh, they become super hardworking uh, one to two years before election. You realize that? That's why they always say, you see, when the road all become new, uh, uh, election is coming again. Now, the reason is because they know that they need to show performance. Now, all directors are like that. They know if they have a short term, they don't perform, they don't get a job. So, it's a way of motivating them to really like be serious to their work. Okay, So, it's to motivate them. Now, number two is also easier to get rid of, now nah, just use a lousy, uh, okay, lousy director, write properly uh, in exam. Alright, it's an easier way to get rid, this get rid, uh, by not re-electing. If the director is not good, just, just don't re-elect. Uh. You, you know, you don't have to do anything to sack them. You just don't renew the contract, understand? Now, This allow the board to refresh the membership. Okay, whatever we are doing now, it allows us to refresh the membership because it's easier for us to bring in new director. Now that is what we practice. Okay, so one last thing is this. So if you want to re-elect director, how do you help the shareholder to make the choice? That's the question. So how do you help shareholder to decide? How do you know that this guy is deserve, is worthy to be re-elected? How do you help shareholders to decide? Now usually this is what we have to do. They say that you must provide sufficient biographical detail and other relevant information. Move up, huh? That's why we usually give them the profile. We'll tell you, oh, this director had this experience, has this qualification and stuff like that, so that at least the shareholder can read and see whether that guy is actually good or not a good candidate. Now, they also say that if it's about reappointing a non-executive director, Okay, you have to write why that this person should be elected. That means the board must justify to shareholder that why this person should be appointed, your reason. And they say that if you are re-electing director, okay, let me use different color. If you are re-electing director, you must confirm to your shareholder that you have already done a performance evaluation. Confirm you have already done a performance evaluation and also confirm that his performance continues to be effective and he continues to be committed. So you must give assurance that this guy is able to do his job. Okay, okay. so that is the last thing we have in section B. So we have looked through the main part of the system. Okay, so I will stop here. Lah. Thank you very much. We are finishing the code very soon. Then uh, we will start with integrated report. I've given you the new set of notes. Okay. Thank you.